morning. Welcome to the first advisory committee on heritable disorders of newborns and children meeting in 2024. And it's great to have so many people in the room. There's some people, including um, committee members I've not met in person, and it's great to flesh you out in all three dimensions. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, um, well, it's not the slide I expected. So I'm gonna do a quick land acknowledgement as we're gathered here in person at 5600 Fisher Lane, Rockville, Maryland. I wanna open the meeting by taking a moment to acknowledge the land we gather on today. We acknowledge that the land and water on which our meeting is taking place was and still is inhabited and cared for by the Susquehannock tribe, the Piscataue peoples, including the Piscataue Kanai tribe and the Chapipto band of the Piscataue Indian nation. We're grateful for their past and continued stewardship of this land and pay our respects to Maryland's indigenous community and their elders, both past and present as well as future generations. Now I'd like to turn things over to Letitia Manning for the roll call. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to HRSA. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with our committee members for roll call. From the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Kamala Mystery. Here. Michelle Kajana. Here. We have Ned Colange. Here. From the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Carla Cuthbert. I'm here. Janine Cody. I'm present. Christine Dorley. Here. From the Food and Drug Administration, Paula Capasino. Here. From the Health Resources Serv and Services Administration, uh, Jeff Brasco. I'm here. Um, Dr. Warren is at a maternal health meeting today, but he should join us by the afternoon, and we'll be here tomorrow for the uh, most of the agenda. Jennifer Kwan. Here. Ash Law. Here. Sean. Oh, yes. Gotcha. Sean McCandless. Here. From the National Institute of Health, Melissa Parisi. Here. And Shanika Anpatkul. Here. And for our organizational representatives from the American Academy of Family Physicians, Robert Ostrander. Here. From the American Academy of Pediatrics, Deborah Friedenberg. Here. From the American College of Medical Genetics, Cindy Powell. Here. From the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Stephen Ralston. From the Association of Maternal and Child Health. From the Association of Public Health Laboratories, Susan Tanksley. Here. From the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, Scott Schoen. Here. From the Association of Women's Health, Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, Shakira Henderson. From the Child Neurology Society, Margie Rehm. Here. From the Department of Defense, Jacob Hoke. From the Genetic Alliance, Natasha Bonham. Here. From the March of Dimes, Siobhan Dolan. Here. From the National Society of Genetic Counselors, Kate Wash Volkley. Here. And from the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, Sue Berry. Here. Thank you. And that concludes our roll call. 
Uh, and now I just have a, a couple of reminders for folks in regards to conflict of interests. Uh, just as a reminder, this is an advisory committee to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, you should consider recusing yourself in all matters likely to affect the financial interests of any organization with which you serve as an officer, a director, a trustee, or general partner, unless you are also an employee of the organization or unless you have received a waiver from HHS authorizing participation. Next slide, please. All committee meetings are open to the public. Meetings and agenda topics are announced in the Federal Register so that the public has the opportunity to participate in meeting discussions. If the public wish to participate in the discussion, the procedures for doing so are published in the Federal Register and or are announced at the opening of a meeting. For the January meeting in the Federal Register notice, we noted that there will be two public comment periods, one today and one tomorrow. Only with advance approval of the chair or DFO may public participants question committee members or other presenters. Public participants may submit written statements. Also, public participants should be advised that committee members are given copies of all written statements submitted by the public. As a reminder, it is stated in the Federal Register Notice, as well as the registration website, that all written public comments are part of the official meeting record and are shared with committee members. Any further public participation will be solely at the discretion of the chair and the designated federal officer or the DFO. So just a reminder for folks, for visitors here in the building, um, you should remain here on the fifth floor you're not permitted to go upstairs. There is um, a cafe with some bites across the way here. There's also a little store with smaller bites to the left there. Um, for bathrooms, there are four bathrooms here easily accessible on this floor. There is one to the right and to the left near the cafe, and there's also one to the right and the left just behind you here. For those of you that are joining via webinar, the audio will come through your speakers. There's also a call-in option if for some reason uh, your audio on your computer speaker isn't working. Um, committee members and organizational representatives, you should have received a, a special panelist link to log in. Please speak clearly and remember to state your name in order to ensure proper recording for the committee transcripts and minutes. And this note applies for those folks that are in person as well, committee members and organizational representatives. Uh, and for the folks that are providing your public comment, please speak clearly into the mic and state your name and your organization. If you're having technical difficulties, please try reopening the webinar or using a different browser or in your registration link, there is a email address you can contact for assistance. And I have one last note. Um, there, the future meeting dates for the rest of 2024 there will be um, meetings that will be either in-person or hybrid, May 9th through the 10th, August 8th through the 9th, and November 14th through the 15th. And please, um, you can refer back to the ACHDNC uh, website for more detailed information about the upcoming meetings and whether they'll be in-person or hybrid. And now I'll turn it back over to Ned. Thanks, Leticia. As you're aware, uh, the committee spent a significant amount of time at the last meeting uh, and time last year in assessing our processes. At the November meeting, we hosted four listening sessions to gather diverse stakeholder input about our nomination and review process. We received a lot of great thoughtful feedback and I wanna thank everyone who participated. A common theme heard across the listening sessions was that our process uh, of nominating a condition for the rest is difficult and burdensome, and it doesn't consider some factors that we know are important to families. 
after thoughtful deliberation, the committee decided there was a need to update the, uh, the committee's evidence nomination and review processes. We decided on the basis of that on a short delay on accepting new conditions until May of 2024 in order to solicit additional feedback from stakeholders and to convene ad hoc topic groups consisting of stakeholders and committee members to uh, look at our processes. I appreciate all those who participated in these meetings and the input they provided. This afternoon, I'll update the committee and everyone here on outcomes of these meetings. As a reminder, during this time, HRSA staff and the committee chair, myself, remain available to provide technical assistance to potential nominators on core elements that are needed for nominations, such as the need for pub published data on the newborn screening test, confirmation test, short and long-term follow-up, treatment, and utility of identification pre-symptomatically versus through clinical ascertainment. <clears throat> the previously nominated uh, conditions that are in the evidence review process, which include CRAB A and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, will follow the current process. Now the next slide. As many of you are aware, the National Academies on Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is conducting a study examining the current landscape of newborn screening systems and processes. The search will also consider sustainable adoption of screening for new conditions using new technologies. The NASM committee will make recommendations for future improvements that help modernize newborn screening to be adaptable, flexible, coordinated communicative and capable of efficient and sustainable adoption of screening for new conditions with new technologies, as well as an equitable public health program from which all infants will benefit. Next slide. The next slide is based on a presentation by Alicia Bank from the Office of Women's Health on Friday, January 26. NASM's work will focus on the following. Uh, examine the RUSP review and recommendation process in light. Let's see, did we get the next slide? This one, okay. Uh, the review and recommendations processes in light of existing and emerging technologies and consider how the committee's evidence-based review process currently works and if additional factors are needed to better understand harms and benefits and to anticipate potential increase of nominated condition. Next, examining state federal capacities to strengthen screening processes and implementation of screening for new conditions added to the RUSP. Next, review existing and emerging technologies that would permit screening for new categories of conditions. Then, research technological and infrastructure needs to improve diagnosis, follow-up, and public health surveillance. And finally, review NBS data collection processes for tracking disease prevalence, improving health outcomes, conducting longitudinal follow-up, ensuring health equity, defining the natural history of conditions that can be screened for, and measuring quality of life. Next slide, please. NASM selected volunteers to serve as committee members for the study. They received over 250 nominees with diverse expertise as patients and family with lived experiences, state-based NBS public health programs, clinical care, existing and emerging technologies, legal and bioethical implications of newborn screening, and healthcare services delivery and payment, just to name a few of the areas of expertise. They plan to have a robust engagement with the public to gain diverse perspectives, hosting virtual focus groups, public comment sessions, at virtual information gathering meetings, and opportunities for written comment. The first meeting of this committee will was this past Friday, January 26. You can sign up for email updates and get details on further engagement plans. You can also submit written statements to the committee via the study's website and via email at newbornscreening at nas.edu. Next slide, please. I would also like to update everyone on Versus um, Co-Propel grants. So the grant notice of funding opportunity or NOFO is open. The NBS Co-Propel program previously funded HRSA grants to strengthen collaborations between state territorial public health agencies and with NBS partners, such as universities, 
nonprofits, or other institutions with expertise in newborn screening in order to achieve a common goal to improve access to services and outcomes for children identified with a heritable condition identified through NBS so they are healthy, growing, and thriving. The grant opportunity will close on February 23rd of 20, uh, this year, and there's a technical assistance webinar scheduled for Wednesday, January 31st, 2024, from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, I wanna thank committee members for reviewing the November um, um, uh, minutes. We've had some committee members provide comments on the minutes, and we're gonna revise those um, uh, after this meeting's over based on their in, in, input and then share updated versions with the committee that we can review and adopt tomorrow. I'd like to talk a little bit about our topics for today. We're going to have presentations focusing on families. And then after lunch, we'll have public con comments. After that will be an update from the ERG on Duchenne muscular dystrophy evidence-based review and I'll provide a proposal for the public health assessment for the decision matrix and end the day with a discussion about our nomination and evidence-based review processes. So it'll be a heavy um, presentation day and hopefully a great discussion day as well. Then to preview tomorrow, the main focus will be on Crab A disease, starting the morning with public comments and a presentation from the ERG on the expedited evidence review for uh, CRAB-A, a committee report from the committee liaisons on CRAB-A, and then a vote on adding uh, CRAB-A disease to the RUSP. We'll end the day with updates from APHL, the Next Steps program. So with that, I would like to launch in to the agenda for today. And uh, sorry if I went that fast, but I'm right on time, which is good. And I'm excited to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Don Bailey from RTI. He's gonna talk about his work on family outcomes in newborn screening. You'll remember that last year we discussed family outcomes and it continues to be a topic of great interest for the committee. As a result, HERSA funded APHL who is working with RTI to assess domains of family outcomes in considering what should be measured for quality of life for individuals and families identified with um, um, heritable conditions through newborn screening. Dr. Bailey is a distinguished fellow at RTI International, where he's a member of RTI's Genomics Translational Research Center. From 2011 through 2017, he served as a voting member on the advisory committee on heritable disorders in newborns and children. Currently, his work focuses on future of newborn screening having published several recent papers on how newborn screening can prepare for a future of new transformative treatments and, genomic, and genome sequencing. He's a senior science advisor for Early Check, a statewide research project to help prepare newborn screening for new conditions and new technology with a current focus on whole genome sequencing. And so I see you made your way up to the podium. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Klonge, and thank you so much for having us here again today. Um, I think I speak on behalf of, um, of Aaron and Sarah and really so many families um, affected by, of ch with children um, who have been impacted by newborn screening or hope to be. And um, we appreciate having a morning devoted to families. This is really a great opportunity for us and we thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. So I'll be um, describing um, the beginnings of a project called Family Outcomes of Newborn Screening Project Background and Overview. This is funded through HRSA, uh, by HRSA through a cooperative agreement with APHL. Great. So I'm speaking on behalf of our, our team today. So Elizabeth Reynolds and Melissa Rasperd um, are here in the audience today. Uh, you may remember that Elizabeth uh, joined me when we spoke um, last time, last uh, time we were here about our early intervention and newborn screening work. So just to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to tell you. Um, first, some summary points. Although newborn screening focuses mostly on benefits to the child, uh, families certainly benefit as well. I think we all know that. Really very little work has been done to assess family outcomes of newborn screening. And there's really no agreement on what those outcomes will be. 
we can talk about quality of life. We can talk about um, you know confidence in child rearing. We can talk about knowledge of your child's condition. There's not really been common agreement on what are the desired outcomes for families. We know what those outcomes are for children for the most part. So our team has a good bit of prior experiencing experience in developing an assessment tool um, to document family outcomes of early intervention. And so we are building on those experiences to develop a tool and process to assess family outcomes in newborn screening. Of course, we believe in that such an instrument could be one important component to assess long-term outcomes of newborn screening in terms of benefits for families. Most of the focus today is gonna to be how we got to this point because we're just engaged in the very beginnings of this process. But I think you'll see from how we got here with our previous work, we'll be following much of the same protocol and processes that we did then. Uh, let me just begin with a couple of definitions. So let's start with family-centered approach. To think back on um, 40 years ago, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, um, uh, Merle McPherson and a number of people back then were really focused on how, how do services become, should, should services be family-centered? Because the essential assumption is that young children cannot be viewed apart from their families, nor can services be um, provided without a consideration of the family context. So families really aren't clients receiving services, but are partners in making decisions about goals and activities. And you can see you have listed the core principles. These are actually pulled from an article that Merle and others wrote um, many, many years ago. Those core principles are really focusing on, on family strengths and diversity and decision-making and empowerment. So you know, we hope that newborn screening is also family-centered. And I think that's an interesting question for us to be asking. And um, maybe some way, some days we can, we can focus on that. So then a couple of other definitions to related more specifically to our project, and I'm gonna differentiate family satisfaction versus family outcomes. So satisfaction is the extent to which families are satisfied or happy with various aspects of the program. Like I'm happy with the amount of services I received, or I think it's of high quality, or this person was really great in supporting me. So it's an evaluation of the process. An outcome is a benefit that families receive as a result of services. It's not the receipt of services, but it's what happens as a result of those services. And so just an example uh, differentiation. So satisfaction might be how a family feels about the quality of the information provided about their child's health condition. And the outcome is how well they actually understand the information, the nature and consequences of their child's health condition. So why would we be interested in assessing family outcomes? Well, the name of this committee has heritable disorders in its name. Heritable disorders are um, by definition family, family um, disorders. Not that the family is disordered, but you know what I'm saying. Child well-being really can't be fully understanding, understood without considering family context. It's really across the childhood age, but especially for infancy. Of course, families play critical roles in their child's health and development. And they're gonna spend more time with their child than any of us individually or collectively are going to be. And so supporting families and having them experience positive outcomes not only helps families, but has direct benefits to children. And so documenting whether and how newborn screening and follow-up affect family outcomes is really essential for understanding uh, long-term consequences. So how did we get there? So this was um, a long time ago, back in the 90s. Um, Congress um, was concerned that early intervention and preschool programs for children with disabilities had no evidence base. Uh, and so they wanted to begin, well, not a strong evidence base for the outcomes of the program specifically. So they began by funding um, several longitudinal studies, um, and one was called NEALS, a National Early Intervention Longitudinal Study. It's a great project. Um, it was a national. It was a, a, a sample of over 3,000 nationally representative sample of children who entered early intervention programs who were followed until kindergarten. We really need a study like that, just editorializing for newborn screening. We need that kind of systematic longitudinal uh, follow-up investigation. So this was a funding to SRI International. I was a consultant on the project and I led the family outcomes component. So we published three uh, papers over the first, first few years of that project um, in pediatrics, uh, focusing on you know, what are families' first experiences with early intervention? What are the outcomes for families at 36 months? 
and what is and, and how do you model both what you know what affects family outcomes and we know that formal supports the things that we do as professionals are important we've also clearly found that over the years many many different studies the informal supports are also critical to family success Melissa did a study also uh, looking at family outcomes in early intervention based on the on that database and then another ba database based on data we can gather from two states. So near the completion of the of the Niels study, um, the U.S. Department of Education then funded something called the Early Childhood Outcome Center. Again, like we don't have really clear agreement on outcomes for families for newborn screening. There is no clear agreement on outcomes for children or for families in early intervention. And the government couldn't prescribe states to all use the same assessment instrument for, um, for early intervention because just like newborn screening, it's a state-based enterprise. But they needed a national center to help articulate what some of those outcomes might be and to help the U.S. Department of Education decide what things should states be reporting every year in the annual report to Congress. So they asked us, uh, the, new, the Early Childhood Outcome Center, and again, this was a collaboration with SRI International, Kathy Hibbler and her colleagues. I led this. So there were two, um, two activities developing a set of child outcomes that could be reported and then a, child fam a set of family outcomes. And I uh, and my team led the family outcomes component. So how did we get there? Can't go into all the processes, but it was a, well, we didn't just close our door and think of what these outcomes might be. We engaged in a series of consensus building activities, collaborating with a lot of different entities, individuals and groups through technical assistance and both to us and from us through research and through recommendations. All these activities, um, let's keep pushing the wrong button here. So the first task was again to identify a broad set of family outcomes. We identified a range of stakeholders, parents, advocacy groups, state agencies, researchers, Researchers, we got input from all these groups through a variety of different means, surveys, focus groups, conference calls, we had advisory boards, we did literature review. I'm going through this because this is the process we'll be going through with assessing family outcomes of newborn screening. And after many, many uh, months of all this, we came up with five simple outcomes. That families ought to be, at the end of early intervention, we would hope that families would understand their child's strengths, needs, and, and special abilities and special needs. They would know their rights and be able to advocate effectively for their children. They would have be confident and confident, confident in their ability to help their child develop and learn. They would have support systems and access to their community. So an example of the overall item, uh, families can help their child develop and learn. They know and use styles of effective parenting. They provide a nurturing and stimulating environment. Use special techniques to, learn, uh, to enhance learning, modify the whole home environment routines, et cetera. So after developing those outcomes, can someone give me like a five minute warning when it's time? We published a paper um, in great detail describing the process of how we got to those outcomes and what was the rationale for each. And that's what we hope to have by the end of this particular funding period for this project is a, is a comprehensive paper saying, okay, here's how we got to, and here's what our recommendations are uh, for family outcomes for newborn screening. So we, um, we went through then several uh, iterations of how you would actually measure that. And so we developed an instrument called the Family Outcome Scale. It was based on the five family outcomes. It's a self-report instrument uh, completed by families. Of course, we can't go, we, it would be very inappropriate for us to go in and say, well, I'm gonna do an assessment of this family and see how they're doing from my perspective. It's from their perspective. We wanna know how they're doing. So we developed items through an extensive literature review again and feedback from parents and professionals. We had two different, actually probably more than two different iterations with modifications based on data and feedback. We published the initial version in 2006. We did a revised version in 2011. The instrument is posted on a website and it's now freely available in 16 languages. This is not something we sell, it's just something that's available you know, for programs to use. So version one looked like this. And this is from, we had both an English and a Spanish uh, version of it. So <clears throat> the, uh, there was an item that said, your child is growing and learning. How much does your family understand about your child's development? We had a one to seven scale. One is just we beginning, sevens we understand a great deal. And there were uh, blank middle points there uh, in case you thought you were maybe in between one and a three. Um, so 
that version was difficult for a lot of families to complete because, and, and Melissa did a study showing that families were much more likely to report one, three, five, or seven than uh, points. And so we, um, Texas and Illinois, oh, Texas um, uh, Department of Early Intervention Programs asked us to, you know, funded us to actually do a revision of the scale. So we wanted to create a new format that would be easier for parents to use. We wanted to revise and expand the survey items to provide more information that states could use in planning program improvement. And we really had not done a psychometric study of the scale before then. And so this was the purpose of this study. So this is the current version of the family outcomes uh, scale revised. You probably can't read that. Um, so I'll just give you the high level picture. The black bars are the five family outcomes. The lighter lines are the items that go of those um, outcome areas and families rate um, themselves on, um, uh, you know, so like we know the next steps for our child's growth and learning and one end of the continuum is not at all and the other end of the continuum is completely. It's an agree, disagree type of format. Um, it's hard to get much more quantitative than that, um, but that's really how the scale is organized. And so on one page, these are outcomes. The U.S. Department of Education really, really wanted states to report satisfaction data. And so that's why, so we developed in a second set of items on the second page here, which are, we don't call it, satisfaction is perceived helpfulness of early intervention. And there's a set of items that we did with that as well. So what do we learn from research using the family outcome scale and then the revised version? <clears throat> well, first, as you can imagine, a lot of different things need to be considered when developing an assessment tool. You know, how do you word the items? We did detailed cognitive interviews where we sat down with parents and went through each item and said, what does this item mean to you? And how do you, how would you think, of, if I ask you this question, how, how would you think about responding to it? We, we have learned that it has very robust psychometric properties. Is wide acceptance across states now in, in reporting back to the US government. Families generally report positive outcomes, which is good, but there's variability. We know that family-centered practices, as I defined very early in the presentation, are highly associated with, uh, with outcomes. Unfortunately, as you would expect, uh, we would hope not be the case, but race, ethnicity, and income and language still are related to um, variability and um, attainment of outcomes. And there's been great interest in um, from this inter international perspective. So um, you, um, Melissa and others and I published a paper on measuring family outcomes, really talked a lot about all the complications and issues in developing such a scale. So this is from a 2020 report. Um, so states are required to report family outcomes every year to the U.S. Department of Education, and they include that in the um, report to Congress. So in this map, um, it reports what instruments states are using. And so some states are still using the original version because they, have, they can choose whatever they want to to measure the outcomes. They just have to report the outcomes. So this shows this, there's some states that are using our original scale and some that are using the revised scale. So the purple states are all using um, the revised scale and the green states are using our um, original scale. So you can see that well more than half of states are using this instrument in one way or the other to report their outcomes to, um, to the government. Um, there have been several international studies, colleagues in uh, Singapore um, did a, a psychometric evaluation of the scale um, in Singapore. A couple of years ago, there was a nice article in, um, you know, in front from Australia looking at the predictors of family outcomes using uh, this instrument um, on children, from children with an autism spectrum disorder. <clears throat> Elizabeth and I are working on a paper based on a longitudinal study of outcomes experienced by families who have a child with congenital Zika syndrome as part of our NICHD funded Zika project. It's an interesting concept though to think about longitudinal analyses. Because if you think about a, a longitudinal analysis of children, you would expect growth over time, right? And so a constant attainment of new developmental outcomes, and you would expect hope for an upward trajectory. For families, it could be more of an up and down thing. So you think about, I know a lot about my child's health, my child's disorder. You might know a lot about it at the beginning. And when you first get information, you feel pretty confident about that. And then there's a new discovery made. You go, oh, wow, now I need to understand something different. And so it's, uh, and anxiety can be up and down as well. And so it's thinking about it from a longitudinal perspective is especially, 
especially challenging. So my final slide, so here's some, here are our primary goals of what I'm getting to what we're actually gonna be doing here. It's to develop a framework and identify domains of assessing family outcomes for newborn screening, like we did before. We're going to be using multiple sources of input and engagement to identify an initial set of outcomes. We're doing an extensive literature review. We're meeting with stakeholders from a variety of different groups. Um, and we have a, an advisory board that we're establishing. Once we come up with a draft set of outcomes, these will be posted for input from anybody. So there'll be a survey with opportunities for quantitative and qualitative feedback. There'll be direct outreach to parent and professional organizations, and we'll have ongoing advisory board feedback. So we'll finalize then a set of outcomes, the recommended outcomes, um, ideally endorsed by diverse stakeholders, and then we'll write an article like we did before, describing those outcomes, the justification for them, and deep rationale for each. We'll begin work then to determine next steps in inst instrument development and um, application. So um, when we first, so the, the funding is only eight or nine months for this project, and so we, for this, for this phase of work, and so we thought maybe we would have a draft instrument by the end of this project. We now realize that the engagement, the community engagement that we need to do and the discussions we need to have, identifying these outcomes and how they fit might fit into an overall longitudinal assessment like what you were just mentioning, uh, Dr. Klange, um, will be very important for us to think about. So there we are, that's where we are. Thanks very much uh, for listening and for the opportunity to talk and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Dr. Bailey. I wonder if you're willing to stand up at the podium while we have a discussion. Sure. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to begin Q&A and discussion. We're going to start with committee members first uh, and then move on to our organizational representatives. For folks in the room, if you could either raise your hand or put your tent up so, so I can see it, I'll try to keep you in order. And I see you already, Jennifer. And then um, if you're online, if you could use find and use the raise hand feature on the Zoom screen, uh, we'll call on you as well. And let's get started with Jennifer. I'm actually really interested. Um, so Jennifer Kwan, committee member from Wisconsin. So I'm really interested to look at the data from Wisconsin, actually. Um, you've motivated me to do that. I was curious if, um, if there's missing data. There, there, there must be families who refuse to participate or don't participate, but I, I, is there any way of tracking them to see? And, and the reason I ask this, of course, is because of the newborn screening um, portion of it. That would be very important, right, as right. an outcome. And it's gonna be more challenging in newborn screening, right? Because early intervention, is a national program, it's a single program, it has many different components to it, but it's a program. Children are tracked for three years while they're in, <clears throat> until they reach 36 months of age, and then, um, then they move into preschool uh, special education programs. And so there's a natural tracking process there. They, but it's families, it's voluntary for families to fill out this instrument. And so there will be missing data for sure. Is that what you're asking? Um, that's part of it. And you know, I don't really think of early intervention as being strictly a national program. Well, I true. think that the administration is not only state-based, but it's county-based. And yes. I think that many people who refer patients for early intervention have seen this directly, that depending on the county you live, the services that you get can be markedly different. And so um, part of my interest in Wisconsin is really trying to see where that data, um, where those data live. and. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I'm not sure which would be harder, but um, it'll be interesting to look at. Thank you. Yeah, so um, at the, in early intervention, yes, you're right. They're county-based or programs within states. They all operate under the state's early intervention Part C program. And that program is, operates under national guidelines. It's just like newborn screening in the sense that the federal government has guidelines for, and it's a little stricter because there's a lot of money that goes to states for early intervention programs. And to get that money, they have to report, they have to submit all the data re related to this report for Congress. So states have a lot invested in getting the data 
but it's up to families to provide it. So, and counties provide it to states, so it gets rolled up to states, and then states take the data and roll it up. There are just a few, um, actually, they only need to report three things to the federal government. So they roll up items for whatever surveys they use to answer those questions. But because of newborn screening, we have a problem with follow-up already. Um, you know, tracking families and uh, after three years is going to be really, really a big issue. Yeah, thanks. Next online, we have Camilla. Thanks, Ned. Um, thanks, Don. That was a great presentation and very important work. Um, I just want to follow up on a, um, something you said in your presentation around the variation that you found in terms of, you know, race, ethnicity, and other demographic characteristics, or really even thinking of this a little bit broadly through an equity lens, and maybe thinking about social determinants of health and other ways we can kind of think about this. Um, how is that going to impact the way we think about uh, the stakeholders and who are coming to the table and um, how, I just wanna make that connection and also learn a little bit more about, you know, what you learned from your, you know, prior work. Right, so there's several things, several things embedded um, within that question. So, you know, in terms of our prior work, we found that a lot of different factors affect family outcomes. And so certainly family-centered practices do, um, certainly what professionals do with families. But um, we have found that families from uh, non-white uh, populations and from low-income uh, groups would statistically have lower outcomes, uh, at least then did, and I'm guessing that's still going to be the case. And because of systemic inequalities and problems in our system, just as you've already as you've already mentioned, so we're hoping a couple of things. One is to make sure that in the context of our our engagement and outreach, that we're engaging as as as, as diverse a stakeholder group as we as we can get to make sure we have the right uh, inputs. It does raise an interesting question about whether the same set of items would apply to everybody. Um, and uh, so I don't know, we don't know the answer to that, but I think we'll learn some through uh, through our processes. But gathering these data, and especially if we can do it in as standardized a way as we can, ought to lead to program improvement. That's the only way you can really start making changes as the ones you described if you have the, if you don't have the data to help inform that. Um, I think just to follow up real quick, I mean, I think some of it is also through the, whether those questions in themselves are, those, how do I say this, are we asking the right questions and really kind of critically thinking about that within sort of that stakeholder period and making sure that we're asking questions that are valid for all populations. And I think that's where we get, where it's really important that we do that and spend the time to make sure of that, particularly given the variation that you've seen. Right, right. And so you can do that in a couple of ways. One is through engagement with the input on to actually developing the items. Then secondly, doing studies that look at outcomes as a function of different, um, uh, of a variety of different factors. So we found that in Singapore, for example, the, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the psychometric properties worked very well. Um, but in other situations we found, well, the psychometric properties in other countries seem to be working quite well, but the question of outcomes and how that relates to a program improvement um, across the nation is gonna be really critical. Shanika. Shanika Ponpatkun, um, committee member. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I wonder, um, since many of the children who had newborn screening were enrolled in early intervention, is there a way to look back a little bit to give us some clue or it's just too broad? Thank you. Um, that's a really good, a good observation. That so many children who've already been, and as we reported earlier, many children um, <laughs> with newborn screening conditions actually do qualify for early intervention and many of them would be in early intervention programs. Getting access to that data would be really hard because the the new early intervention programs don't necessarily code um, you know the specific disorder as to whether they're eligible in terms of having a developmental delay um, or a condition that could lead to a developmental delay 
But that's an interesting point. And I think ultimately, and we've talked about this at the last meeting about trying to come up with some better ways to integrate newborn screening and early intervention. That could be one way to do it is look at those data systems. Michelle. Thanks for that presentation, um, Michelle Kajana. Um, I was just kind of, I know that you've had some discussions with some of the regional genetic genetics networks, but I'm wondering if you could just describe a bit in in like real practice boots on the ground, how you ensure that you're getting a true voice from families. Because um, we all are, we all know the families that we work with, but how do you find and engage those other families to give you a complete picture? Yeah, so that's really a good, an important question, right? So we're working through some of the regional genetics networks. They're organizing focus groups for us and <clears throat> potentially doing some surveys. We'll be working, reaching out to a variety of different um, parent organizations. Um, um, but you're right. The people that are affiliated with those groups don't necessarily represent the nation at large. So I don't have a good answer for you yet, Michelle, but <clears throat> we're working to try to figure out how we would get as many voices as we can, and then provide as much uh, opportunity for input once we've done some initial development work. Sean. Sean McCann. Uh, Greg is good. Sean McCann, this uh, committee member. Uh, I think my question is partly answered and partly not. I have two questions. The first is, um, who do you define as the stakeholder groups? Because it seems to me that newborn screening is a different is a different thing than early intervention, where you've got people that are engaged in the intervention. That that's your stakeholder group. Uh, there are, uh, would appear to be multiple stakeholder groups related to to newborn screening outcomes, and I would like to understand better the strategy for defining and and recruiting from each right. of those stakeholder groups. The second question is, how do you propose to separate out satisfaction around newborn screening from satisfaction around follow-up and care right. and management and early intervention and all the other things that happen after newborn screening? Yeah, so I'll take on the first one first because that's a hard, because it's the hardest question, right? I mean, because newborn screening, once you finish the lab work, it's a scatter shot, right? You go to this clinic or that clinic, you get services here and there, and it changes over time. You got your regular visit pediatrician, you've got specialized treatment services. It becomes not so much a system anymore. And so how do you evaluate? Can you evaluate the system or do you can do you end up having and at what point in time are we gonna say, okay, at 36 months and 24 months, where are families who've been identified through newborn screening? And is it uh, are we evaluating their experiences with their specialty clinics, with their genetic counselors, with their, um, you know, their, their physicians? So what we're trying to do is focus on, at first, outcomes irrespective of um, a particular service context and just say, where are our families now right at this point in time? It's going to be very hard to answer the question of evaluating newborn, the newborn screening system, right? Because it's really not a system. And I mean, early intervention is hard enough, but it's not really, it is more of a system than newborn screening is, at least over the first three years of life. Um, there were a lot of stakeholders, there are a lot of stakeholders still in early intervention. You think of physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, early childhood special educators, case managers, counselors, family support professionals. Uh, and, and pediatricians. And so there's, there are stakeholders there already. Um, we do have, we're, we're putting together our advisory, expert advisory board right now. And so we have representatives from a number of the key um, kind of stakeholder groups in newborn screening, but there's so many. Um, how do we do that with, with all of those people? And so in part, we'll be getting input, but then initial input. But the biggest thing is once we have an initial draft, it's just, spreading the draft out as widely as possible uh, through advocacy groups, through professional organizations. Um, the last time we did that, I can't remember, Melissa, we got a thousand and something suggestions for items. And we were doing cue sorts on the floor and looking at how different items came together and really trying to understand it from different perspectives. So your point's really well taken. Thanks, Sean. Just to follow up, um, Sean McCann is committee member. Can you specifically tell us who are the 
who are the groups that you're trying to measure outcomes within? Because what I've heard is a lot about individuals that have positive newborn screens and turn out to be affected with the condition of interest. It seems to be another obvious group that it would be very important for us to understand is individuals that have a positive newborn screen but turn out not to have an underlying condition for which right. the screening test was intended. And then there's the larger group of individuals who end up having a negative screen. And how, how do you propose or what is the plan for ensuring that there's adequate representation of all three of those stakeholder groups in the outcomes that you that you intend to find? So I guess I would differentiate you know, the outcomes themselves from the context and the populations. And so in some ways, the instrument we developed is very agnostic in terms of those kinds of groups. And I would hope that this one would be relatively the same so that it could be used in all three of those situations. So you would wanna know what the outcomes were of families who received false, false positive results. You would wanna know outcomes for families whose condition wasn't on the RUSP and who experienced having a child with a particular condition that could be on the RUSP in the future, wouldn't that be really important data to come to the for the committee to consider um, in terms of making decisions about uh, about whether adding a condition to the RUSP? And I know that Aaron and Sarah are going to be talking about this very this very issue is um, how do we weigh? And of course, you, as you know, I've been talking over the years, but how do you how do you bring in the family voice in in addition to um, you know public comments? How do we bring in data? from about family experiences and outcomes to really help inform um, the decisions of this important decisions this committee makes. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Brasco Hersa. And so it, it might help with some of the context, Sean, and then I do have a question. So remember that, was it 20 years ago that this committee started talking about, we need to look at long-term follow-up for what's happening to one screen. I think it was Alex Kemper's paper back when he was a young man. And since then, we've been reiterations of those papers and more work. And we at HRSA um, have funded some long-term follow-up programs and do more in screening. And they're putting together some really interesting data and thinking about this. Um, you'll recall that we presented this sort of three buckets of data where um, Carl and the CDC folks are in that first bucket looking at analyzing data and the second is follow-up. And the long-term follow-up, what does that fit in? And we do hope um, at future meetings to be able to start saying, what might that roadmap look like? But that's five or 10 years out, right? Because as everyone's been pointing out, there's so much complexity here. When we start thinking about what those long-term outcomes might be, well, obviously there's the individual child um, and systems level things, right? And so maybe connections to part C. If you look at the way we follow the EDI program, the, the uh, newborn hearing screening, the 136 that everyone hears about, that six month outcome is actually connection to part C. So it's a systems level measure. So we can imagine something like that. And what Don and his team are working on is what is the outcome measure for families? And as you point out, it could be used in different contexts. It could be used in a research context, a continuous quality improvement approach. And we are agnostic to what that system looks like because it's still kind of a dream, um, but we're trying to move toward it. And this all leads to kind of my question for Don, which is I heard about outcomes. Are you also thinking about quality of life? Because you can imagine that just how families are doing, you know, inherent to themselves is a worthy outcome of newborn screening. Yeah, so that could end up being one of the domains um, for, for this particular instrument. We considered that in the early intervention program, and it was one of the nominate. It was one of the five. It was it was a six domain at that time. We got huge pushback from states because they said we can't be responsible for family quality of life. <laughs> and isn't that an interesting response? But their point was that quality of life is affected by so many other things that to to put it on the program was was a challenging thing for them. And so we. We didn't have it as a part of the instrument. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's really the bottom line, isn't it? We, everybody wants a good quality of life for families and a good quality of life for children. There are great scales out there. There's a one item quality of life measure that you can use as highly, highly predictive. And so we could use something like that. But I think what you're bringing up, Jeff, is a broader question about what is the I don't like to use the word battery, but what is the collection of measures that we would want to look at in terms of evaluating the system overall? And, and what we're looking at here is a, a piece of that. So um, child outcomes is, might be even harder 
because you got condition A, you're going to be looking at one set of outcomes. Condition B, you're looking at a completely different set of outcomes. Here, we hope to have a relatively standard set of outcomes that could be used across families, recognizing it's not going to work for everybody. Yeah, just a, a quick follow-up on that, because we at HRSA think about this a lot. And if there are 13,000 conditions that make up children with special health care needs, coming up with individual child measures is surely impossible. Yeah. But it may be that family outcome measures are kind of the universal common denominator mm -hmm. that connects. And is there, you know, so if a child has cancer or sickle cell disease or hemophilia or methamelonic acid right. type 1A, yeah, they're all going to have different outcomes, but family well-being might be sort of one that cuts across all right. and tells you how well the system is working. You have an overall construct like understanding your child's condition. You know, that can apply. That's the same. That can apply to every one of those conditions you mentioned and everyone on the rust. You can come up with a way to assess that. It's agnostic again, a disease agnostic in some ways. Chris, you know, I'll get to you in just a minute, but I wanted to follow up on that because you came close to <laughs> the, the issue about the value of an improvement in the measurement on this scale. So I... The reason I bring that up is that ultimately, in my mind, somewhere down the line, right. these measurements will feed into committee decisions trying to balance um, um, benefits and harms. And there's always this kind of unspoken harm about resource utilization and opportunity mm -hmm. costs. And so the question comes down, are you already thinking about, you know, what is the value statement for an improvement in this score? Does that make sense? Because we do it for quality adjusted life years, right? We we have a number. We maybe it's not a very good number, but it's a number that's right. used in healthcare to decide what to fund and what to not fund. So it's just kind of a question: yeah. is it translating to a value or that we can balance in terms of other things the committee looks at? I don't mean to be flipping this response or to avoid it. <laughs> But to say that we're trying to focus right now on the development of the measure. And then what you're just asking is about context and what, you know, you can have a measure of quality of life years, but what is the meaningful quality of life years, right? And so we can't make that, what we're trying to do is first of all, figure out how you measure it. And then it gets fed, and fed into a system that says, well, for us to make a condition, a decision, we really need to see this kind of change or this kind of status. So you start with the right measurement tool. Yeah, I, I only brought it up since by the time the committee starts thinking about this, right. I'll be long gone. That's <laughs> Christine. Sure, just a, just a question that I have regarding the different states using the several different surveys. Do you have any issues with data quality? And then what incentives are there for states to transition to the survey that you prefer? So there is no incentive for them to transition to our particular survey because the state, the, the federal government can't require a state. What they require is them to report every year. There's, there's three family outcomes that, th that they report. And so they can roll up the answer to those outcomes based on our instrument or based on any other measure or if they can develop their own, their own scale. So there's no... Um, incentive right now for them to do that. Now, in the Neal study, we had a, a standardized set of questions, and those became the, the focus of a, of a longitudinal study. And so I think you know, we have two really different kinds of questions here. One is what would ultimately be a reporting system for newborn screening programs when, if there was one? Um, you know, when would these data be collected and so forth? And then the other, the other question is in the context of a research study, if you were going to really do a national newborn screening longitudinal study, um, you know, how would you, you would have to have much more focus on reliability of gathering the data and using it in a systematic way with the same instrument. <laughs> One other thought I had regarding your outcome on your survey question two, it talked about um, we are able to find and use services and programs. There's a difference with being able to find a program but then why don't you use it? Right. And so in the African-American community, immigrant community, there's a lot of mistrust because you have providers yeah. that don't look like they do. Right. And so is there any plan to kind of delve into that a little bit more? Because that does affect the health outcomes sure. um, because of access and not being able to, you know, in your community, mm -hmm. take part in a particular yeah. serv uh, service. 
I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer your question. I mean, I think, again, uh, if designed properly, the scale would describe whether or not they can find, they feel confident in finding services. But then the question is, well, what are the factors that influence, and use could be another thing. We use, we, you know, we know how to use the services, we access them. What are the factors that contribute to some families accessing and using them and others, and, and others not accessing and using them? So again, the tool becomes the vehicle for understanding the questions that you're as asking. Bob, I think you get the last comment or question. Well, thanks. Um, Robert Ostrander, American Academy of Family Physicians, and it's good to have a family-centered uh, uh, morning here. Um, looking at your uh, uh, matrix uh, reminded me a lot of Carl Cooley's Medical Home Index from 20 years ago, which is my entree into kind of this world. I was part of the ADHQ Learning Collaborative for Children with Special Health Care Needs. Um, and from then forward, one thing I have heard from our parent partners over and over again that they value is that they're good days being good days. In other words, that their diagnosis, follow-up, and treatment program allows them to relax on their good days when they're just home hanging out, mm -hmm. and especially on their good days when they have special events planned. Um, and I wonder if perhaps the notion of measuring quality of life might be better assessed by picking one or two narrow measures of quality of life and including questions like that. And I was a little curious about the fact that you have a whole support system section and none of that has to do with medical support system. And it looks to me like the only medical question in there is our medical and dental needs are met. And I wonder if there should be some more expansion of what our medical needs means in terms of family outcomes. I think, I mean, my the parent partners, this isn't my brain, that my parent, the parent partners over yeah. you know, 23 years with us that told me that's one of their key things is being able to relax on their good days. And if something goes south, they know who to call and it's going to get taken care of. I'm going to throw in a quick second question just for thought. And that is, you know, I'm from a little tiny rural area and I, in the DEIJ world, I think rur rurality is the word is coming out is, is it needs mm -hmm. to be considered as well because it doesn't get assessed in terms of the disparities mm -hmm. that those of us in rural areas face when people are focused on the other areas of disparity. Thank you. Yeah, so all the questions that everyone has brought up are really important and they, they point to the complexity of actually what you know, first might seem a simple task and not simple at all. Um, your comment about the medical components, it, it's likely that that will be more salient in the newborn screening context than it is in the, in the early intervention context. And so we'll see what we learn uh, from, from you know, the, get in, the gathering the data process. Um, your good days and bad days comment made me think about a little bit about some things we wrestle with with the instrument itself. So if since it's a, you know, parent's perception, you know, the day they fill it out, is it a good day or a bad day? Um, and how that affects their reporting of, because I know I go through days where I feel like I'm in control of things and the next day I'm going, oh my gosh, you know. Um, so there are measurement issues and, sub, and around both timing and subjectivity of the skill that are gonna be really important to think about. It's not gonna be a perfect instrument by any means, but we have to start somewhere, I think, because we have nothing now. I hope uh, everyone will join me in thanking Don for his excellent presentation and discussion. Thank you. As he sits down, I want to point out that Dr. Kemper will always be young to me. Now we'll have two presentations focusing on research related to family perspectives. Both of the presentations serve as examples of the kind of the research the committee could use during evidence reviews to better understand family and other benefits for population level screening of new conditions. Examples would be especially relevant at the end of the day when we start discussing the kinds of evidence that the committee can consider when reviewing that benefit on specific conditions. First, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Ackerman from the University of California, San Francisco. She will be joining us virtually. Dr. Ackerman will be sharing her research on families search for meaning and value in rare genetic disorders. She's an associate professor of behavioral sciences at the University of California, San Francisco, 
and is a medical anthropologist working in the interdisciplinary fields of empirical bioethics and implementation science. Her research draws on ethnographic methods to examine social, ethical, and equity issues in genomics. Dr. Ackerman also investigates parents' community member perspectives on health data sharing and the feasibility of participatory data governance models. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Ackerman. Welcome. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to share my screen now so you can see my slides. Okay, hopefully everyone is seeing my uh, regular slide deck here. Let me know if not. Um, we can see it. Great, thank you. It's so good to be with you all today. Thank you, and thank you to Dr. Brasco for inviting me. Um, I, I, I am going to be talking about families' experiences today, and um, in particular, I'm going to be um, focusing on uh, the question of utility or the value of genomic sequencing for children with rare conditions that are suspected to have a genetic etiology. And I want to just acknowledge right off the bat that um, whether we can even use the term diagnostic in genomics is contested. Um, a clinical diagnosis is, is very different from um, etiological information generated through a molecular level analysis. So I just want to say that um, right off the bat, there, uh, our team used the term di diagnosis a lot, but the ethics group didn't always agree with them. <laughs> so that's something we can talk about. Um, I'm going to consider current definitions and approaches to understanding utility. And then I'll share um, some of the findings um, from a study that we did with diverse families um, in uh, undergoing genetic sequencing. I'll conclude by suggesting that an expanded conceptualization of utility can help us better understand the full scope of what matters to families and will enable us to assess whether potential benefits of diagnostic sequencing are likely to be equitably distributed. So um, existing definitions of utility are usually presented in a binary. Um, so there, if we think about emerging genomic technologies, they're usually assessed based on clinical utility or how they inform clinical care and health outcomes. Of course, also important, particularly in, in my area of research is personal utility. And um, what we indicate by this is sort of the effects of these new technologies on the lives of um, individual and, and children, um, but in particular on how people think, feel, and behave after they receive genetic information. Um, so I, I put a red box here around this social dimension of personal utility. Um, this includes the impact of genomic information on social support, access, experiences of our fear of discrimination, and also access to non-clinical services. Um, so this is really where we get into families' day-to-day -day lives um, and efforts to care for their child. But unfortunately, this category of personal utility has received a lot less attention from researchers particularly in terms of the experiences of underserved and disadvantaged families um, who have a child with a suspected genetic condition. So in an essay that's hot off the presses and co-authored by um, Dr. Erin Goldenberg, who will be speaking after me today, um, the idea of middle ground utility is uh, put forth as a way to shift attention uh, to the potential benefits of um, genomic testing that fall outside the, this conventional binary I just described. Um, so this encompasses the sort of neglected social utility category I just mentioned. In particular, the services provided by special education teachers, occupational therapists, and other uh, community-based providers who are usually outside of the mainstream clinical um, arena. So, um, you know, families know well the complex service landscape that they and their children with special needs enter into. And here I have a one parent's depiction of the many sort of service neighborhoods, if you will, that they navigate. And I want to thank Kristen Lynn for allowing me to use this image, which she calls care mapping. Um, so it's very hard to see, I realize, and I think that's part of the point. Uh, but in the lower left, the blue area is the uh, medical system. And genetics is just one small bubble <laughs> among many. And there are other domains, of course, including developmental assessments, school, 
uh, advocacy and leadership, recreation and community, legal and financial, and social support. So most of the work coordinating care across this you know, very complex, loosely connected network of agencies, organizations, and informal groups falls on parents and caregivers. But in, at least in the research world, we don't know much about the journeys of families through this care landscape, especially underserved families. So um, the real question here then is um, what role does uh, rare genomic diagnosis or um, etiologic information uh, play as families try to navigate through complicated service landscapes? And I think that um, qualitative approaches to understanding this are really essential to help us answer this question um, because it allows us to have in-depth engagement with families both outside the clinical setting and over time. So uh, I, this brings me to the empirical work that I'll be sharing with you today. Um, and this is um, based in the program in prenatal and pediatric genomic sequencing. Our acronym was PEGS. This is a study that took place at the University of California, San Francisco from 2017 to 2022, and we're still analyzing some of the data. PEGS was one of six clinical sites in um, an NIH consortium called CSER, or Clinical Sequencing Evidence Gen Generating Research. It was the second iteration of CSER. And a primary goal of the consortium was to recruit a high proportion of participants from populations that have been historically excluded from genomics research, including underrepresented minority um, and medically underserved populations. So the NIH mandate was for sites to recruit at least 60% uh, of people um, who could be classified in these categories. So the aims of the PEG study was to examine the clinical utility of using exome sequencing um, for children who had previously undiagnosed um, either neurocognitive or um, congenital conditions that had a suspected genetic etiology, as well as pregnant women with a fetal anomaly detected by ultrasound. And this was one of the first studies to do prenatal sequencing. Um, the second aim was to explore ethical and social issues in returning rare etiological information to diverse families. We had uh, recruitment sites in San Francisco, Oakland, and Fresno, California, and you can see the um, number of families recruited at each site. There were uh, significant challenges in recruitment in our community settings at the General Hospital in San Francisco and Fresno. Happy to talk about that later because there's a lot to say there about the research capacity with our community partners. Um, and here is the overview of our uh, families who enrolled. We had 845 families total. 529 of them were in the pediatric arm. I'm going to be focusing specifically on our pediatric arm. Um, mainly because the uh, study populations are really different demographically, as well as what we learned from families in terms of uh, pregnant women undergoing sequencing versus families with children. Uh, but we do have quite a few publications um, coming out on our, on our prenatal families' experiences. So in the pe pediatric arm, 82% of our families um, were covered by California's Medicaid program, Medi-Cal, and I think this is an indication um, that many of our families were economically disadvantaged. Um, the families were also very demographically diverse in terms of the languages spoken, as well as self-reported race and ethnicity. Um, and our Hispanic Latino families comprised about 40% of our pediatric population. So um, our ethics team conducted an ethnographic project to understand families' experiences as they enrolled in the study and received results, as well as after they received results. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with ethnography, it's an approach used by anthropologists um, and other social scientists in which researchers really try to immerse themselves in a particular setting uh, in order to observe behaviors and interactions up close and understand cultural phenomenon from the point of view of the people that um, we are studying. So we conducted uh, clinic observations, um, both at the um, enrollment time period, as well as during results return, 
and we conducted longitudinal interviews with parents um, after they received the results and then again six months later to understand um, what their ongoing um, experience was. And we focused in particular on expectations of uh, genetic testing. Many of these families have ne had never done any genetic testing before, uh, although many had been on a long diagnostic odyssey. Uh, their understandings of the results they received, any um, health and other re related decisions based on learning the results, and also their day-to-day -day lives and social context. So uh, we conducted a total of 61 interviews with 32 families. 40% uh, of our interviews were conducted in Spanish. Uh, we did speak with mothers, fathers, and caregivers, and sometimes the children themselves wanted to participate in the interviews. Um, and that was actually really rewarding to us um, to talk to the whole family. Uh, mothers were most likely to participate than, than others. And we also observed uh, 49 enrollment and consent sessions and 53 return of results sessions. So uh, I want to emphasize here that we, in, in considering who to interview, we decided to oversample uh, for families with positive results. And what I mean by that is families who received um, uh, etiologic information that pointed to a likely genetic cause of their child's condition. Um, and we were very interested in understanding the impact on families of learning that their child's condition had a genetic explanation, uh, but we also wanted to talk to families who received inconclusive and negative results, so that was in about half of our sample. And on the right, you can see the overall results from the pediatric population. Far more people received negative and inconclusive findings. Um, so now I'm going to turn to what we learned from families about the utility of genomic information. There's so much to say here. So this is this is a snapshot. Um, but in addition to seeking an explanation for their child's condition, many parents told us they were also looking for information and assistance that would help them better care for their child on a day-to-day -day basis. So when asked what she expected from exome sequencing when enrolling the study, one mother said, maybe if there was something that no one was trying to help me with and that she needed, number one is school. Um, and you know, similarly, um, and this was during an observation of an enrollment session, a mother who was considering enrolling in the PEGS project asked, actually asked our ethnographic team, um, and we had to defer this question to the clinicians, but asked, whether um, enrolling the study would help the family qualify for IHSS uh, or in-home support services, which is a, a state-sponsored program that pays for home care, for home care services for um, older adults and disabled children. And they had not qualified previously. So she was hoping that an etiologic diagnosis would help. Um, she ultimately decided not to enroll in the study. Uh, we also learned that parents and clinicians became uh, partners in creating value, and, and this really points to how utility is a relational um, phenomenon. So families in interactions with clinicians learned to lower their expectations of a diagnosis, uh, that a cure or improved treatment um, options was quite unlikely, um, that pursuing further knowledge was good parenting. They learned to absolve themselves of any guilt they carried, that perhaps their child um, it was their fault or their child had inherited um, the condition from them. And they also learned uh, to have faith in what genomic science might learn in the future uh, and to defer their, their hopes for the present. And so this parent's quote really sums up the sentiment. We don't know exactly yet what he has, but we are on the right path. Uh, we found that for many parents, etiologic information prompted a lot of relief, even if um, what they learned did not provide a complete answer. So uh, one child who had um, a, an autism diagnosis um, and shorter stature, the mother told us um, it definitely answered the growth issue. So there was a genetic variant returned to them, uh, but there really wasn't um, any genetic known genetic etiology of the child's autism. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of parents told us they were very frustrated. Um, uh, the parents who received a positive result even sometimes said that, such as this example, um, who's these, 
parents said they haven't helped us at all. We just have a name, but we don't know what it means. And what they're referring to in terms of the name is the name of the gene. So many of these results are so rare that it's a gene name about which very little is known other than that it probably um, explains the child's condition. And another issue for a lot of parents was they would receive either a negative or an inconclusive result, and they were frustrated because they hadn't heard back from the research team about the possibility of reanalysis. So this mother said, I'm kind of waiting for your team to let me know once you have more information in terms of that specific mutation as more people get testing done. So this is a real issue with uh, families enrolled in research who are um, hoping to benefit from developments in genomic science, but after the study ends, um, especially families without insurance willing to pay for additional genetic testing, what happens to these people? So we found that um, for um, some parents, uh, a genetic diagnosis did facilitate access to community-based services. Uh, the mother of, of a two-year-old, um, and important to mention that the result for this child was associated with a well-known syndrome, told us that um, this diagnosis helped her child get into um, Head Start, and that the genetic um, information really kind of prompted that. Um, so she, this was a success story for her. Uh, other parents, on the, on the other hand, and we found this to be a more common story, especially with our um, socioeconomically disadvantaged families, that they really struggled to use genomic information. So um, one mother of a five-year-old whose result was not associated with a known syndrome, is a rare variant, said, even though I took the genetics papers to the school, they didn't pay much attention to it. So her efforts to improve her child's access to special education did not succeed. And another mother similarly told us, uh, she said it did not change the clinical diagnosis, it did not change the IEP, but it did create sort of an animosity between myself and the school district. So there was sort of a mismatch in the parent's expectation and what the school was actually able to do with this rare genetic information. So um, we've uh, really ultimately found that families' ability to realize what we think, might think of as middle ground or social utility were shaped in part um, by the type of result, and there's some indication that symptom, syndromes with known behavioral traits and developmental trajectories are more translatable to the service sector than rare variants um, that as yet are not associated with well-characterized syndromes. Also, how long a child has been in the system seems to matter a lot. So prior assessments and clinical diagnoses seem to really have a lot more sway um, than um, rare genetic information. And we also found that families' ability to advocate for their child and to use etiologic information in that effort is really shaped by how well they're able to mobilize certain knowledge, skills, and resources. And we call this cultural capital. Um, and its unequal distribution really puts socially and economically marginalized family at a distinct disadvantage. So what our concern is that the potential benefits of a rare diagnosis may be inequitably distributed. So just want to conclude by um, encouraging us to sort of shift toward a more expanded, multi-level conception of utility, which really can be understood as produced through these dynamic interactions between families, clinicians, healthcare systems, schools, and other organizations, as well as emerging technologies, um, such as exome and genome sequencing, as well as um, health and social service policies. So uh, it's some questions that I think need answering include what role does genomic information play in families' ability to access services and their day-to-day -day lives, as well as their uh, overall well-being? Are schools and community-based service providers able to use genomic information alongside functional and clinical assessments? Particularly these very rare diagnoses are starting to be generated more now that we have access to exome and genome sequencing. And finally, how do federal, state, and local policies shape the meaning and actionability of genomic information? And I think it's very important that we answer these questions for all families. And specifically, do emerging genomic technologies mitigate or exacerbate existing disparities in access to services? Um, so I, I also just really want to thank all the families um, who spoke with us. And um, what I've including here is some screenshots of a comic book style story we created um, in collaboration um, 
with uh, an artist um, health educator at Booster Shot Media and some of the families who are involved in PEGS. And in this story, we depicted a fictional family undergoing exome sequencing. And we brought in a lot of the themes that we learned from our interviews with families with the goal of explaining to families what we learned in the study and thank them, thanking them for participating. Um, and we sent this uh, comic book out to the families last year. And also want to acknowledge uh, the PEGS research team, in particular, our ethics group. Um, so thank you so much. And I'll, um, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. I'm, I'm hoping you can stay uh, with us a little bit more till after the next presentation and be present for discussion and questions. This is such critical work, helping us catch up with uh, understanding what we should do with the technology now that we can do it. So this, I think, is lagged behind our uh, technological advances. And so filling in that gap is just critical. Um, now we're going to hear from Dr. Aaron Goldenberg from the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. The title of his presentation is The Value of Values, Expanding Assessment of the Benefits and Harms Through Social Science Data. Dr. Goldenberg is a professor and vice chair in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He is also director of the Case Western Bioethics Center for Community Health and Genomic Equity. Dr. Goldenberg has a background in bioethics, health behavior, health education, public health ethics, and public health genetics. He has focused his work on the ethical, social, and equity issues associated with the integration of new genomic technologies into research, clinical, and public health settings. Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you. It is such an honor to be with all of you and to be in person. I will not let the lion's loss from last night uh, reduce my enthusiasm for today's conversations. Um, <laughs> but there are lots of uh, families in Detroit uh, having a sad day today. <laughs> um, so thank you, Dr. Collange and uh, Dr. Brasco for inviting me. And it's just so, so great to be with the committee and to be with all of you. My hope is that through this conversation and through these slides, I'll turn our attention a little bit to methodological questions, to some theoretical questions about how we can take families' experiences, how we can listen to families and integrate that into our considerations, whether those are for new conditions, whether those are for the kinds of support structures that families need, but really to think about the value of social science data in these conversations and what I'm calling the value of values. There we go. <laughs> All right. So this slide is not going to be dissimilar to many slides that you have seen in the past, talking about the concept that you know newborn screening is on kind of the cusp of really translational change, um, both in terms of the kinds of conditions that are being re recommended or kinds of conditions that are being nominated, potentially later onset conditions, more uncertainty with particular conditions the potential use of genomic screening, and then, of course, um, the questions surrounding what happens to data and samples after are all putting us in a situation where we start seeing the future of newborn screening uh, uh, to have uh, the need for a lot of changes, a lot of different ways of thinking about uh, the work that we do, while also trying to preserve the benefits of screening for families. This is where I think social science data is going to be incredibly, incredibly crucial. Um, and the problem is, as you've heard from our previous two speakers, is there's really a lack of data pertaining to family perspectives, particularly both parental and kind of public perspectives related to the kinds of changes that we're talking about in newborn screening. And what data is there, which there is really amazing data out there, I think is underutilized. It's vital that we have data from stakeholders to both manage expansion of newborn screening changes in newborn screening in a really transparent manner that maintains the ethical justification of newborn screening. And as was mentioned in the last session, to maintain trust in the system. We talk a lot about trust uh, and trying to get families and communities to trust us. But I know one of the things that we've talked about a lot recently is really changing that narrative from one of trust to one of trustworthiness. And how do we create programs that maintain our trustworthiness so that families and communities continue to benefit and continue to feel trusting in what we're doing. Uh, and so I think 
as we're talking about expanding notions of benefits and harms in newborn screening, the kinds of data that were presented in the previous two, in two presentations are exactly what we need to be hearing, not just about the benefits and harms to individual newborns, but also to families and society. And we need really complex and deep data to be able to do that. So what do we mean by assessing values? And these are just gonna be some questions that I think we need to be talking about together. So whose values, whose perspectives, whose concerns, whose expectations are we thinking about? Are we only hearing from parents with children with a particular condition? Are we only hearing from public generally? Are we hearing from parents? We need to have a lot more precision about who we're talking about when it comes to these kinds of data. What are the values about? Are they about screening a particular condition? Is it just generally about newborn screening issues? Is it about newborn screening disparities or access to care? Something that we've talked a lot about on this committee over the last few sessions. When are we talking to people? Is it during a pilot stage for a condition? Is it in states that are already screening conditions and what family's experience has been like after getting screening? Or is are we talking about an activity that maybe goes directly hand in hand with the evidence review process that we can think about social science data that might be part of an evidence review itself. How are we actually getting information from families? Are we doing it through surveys or in, 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 interviews with individuals and families? Are we thinking about focus groups or small group dialogue sessions? There are lots of innovative approaches, including ethnography that we just heard from the last, uh, last uh, session, uh, deliberative democracy sessions that some of you maybe have participated in and other innovative approaches. The question that's on the table for all of us is why are we doing this? Is it to improve the matrix? Is it to improve our evidence review process to impact a final score for this committee's decision of yes or no for a particular condition? Or is it to impact the ways in which the committee's recommendations for things like state resources for parents or for clinicians or for choices of variants or how we return results? Is it more process oriented? Is it about other recommendations for the kinds of resources that we think families will need post screening? Is it about access or follow up? Is it about education or potentially consent for some conditions? I think part of one of the things that is a big part of our conversations in some of the social science work in newborn screening is this question, which is as we expand, do we start thinking about parental authority differently? Do we start, start thinking about the mandatory nature of newborn screening differently in order to give potentially families choice around particular conditions. That's a hard conversation to have, but one that I think we need to hear from families about before we move forward. So there's, I think for me, there are three problems in using these kind of data in newborn screening. Um, the first one is that newborn screening harms and benefits to families raised in committee meetings, in other meetings, in lots of different things tend to be anecdotal or hypothetical. We worry about particular harms, we talk about particular harms, but we don't have enough data to show whether or not those harms are actually real and tangible and are experienced by families. The burden of proof I think has been kind of historically higher for, for, um, uh, for benefits. And I think maybe we need to be rethinking the way we think about the burden of proof for harms as well. And the problem here is really, there's just a lack of data. We don't have enough data on these kinds of harms or benefits from expanded newborn screening, for example. The second challenge is that when we do have data, Many times that data is dismissed as anecdotal or non-scientific. Many people who don't know science, social science research or haven't worked in social science research may not think about the data that we're presenting, both qualitative and quantitative data, in the same way that they do other kinds of clinical data. And I think the problem is maybe a lack of understanding of what social science data is or how it can be helpful. And then the final one is even when it is appreciated, when data of on harms or benefits to society is part of our considerations, they're not systematically integrated into the evidence review problem. So the science itself doesn't actually get into our final decision making process. So across these three, either there's not enough data, the data is dismissed, or the data is included but not actually systematically included in evidence review, we have a real problem of not getting these family voices, these family narratives, these family experiences into our considerations and I think measurable and um, uh, robust enough ways. 
So I'm gonna give an example from Screen Plus. This is a uh, comprehensive, flexible, multi-disorder newborn screening pilot program that we've heard about on this committee before, PI'd by uh, Melissa Wasserstein in New York. Uh, it's a consented pilot run in conjunction with the New York State Screening Program. The goal is to enroll 100,000 babies at eight uh, high birth rate, ethnically diverse hospitals over five years in the New York City area. The goals were to assess the analytical and clinical validity of multi-tiered screening for a fluid panel of multiple disorders. We've heard about that study multiple times, um, but what I'm gonna be talking about is this last part, which is assessing the ethical, legal, and social issues from parents' feedback, including interviews and surveys um, of parents who have enrolled in, in, in Screen Plus. So all parents who enroll in Screen Plus get an opportunity to participate in further surveys or interviews, either about their experience with Screen Plus or about other newborn screening issues. And we're trying to create a stable platform to hearing from families, both who have screened positive for a condition, but also families who are just enrolled in Screen Plus, have, an, are, have their children are negative for a condition, but whose voices may still be important to hear from on big newborn screening issues. So the LC components of Screen Plus kind of fall into three different categories. So there's consent feedback, uh, a consent feedback survey. This is really about the research itself. We hear from families about what they liked, what they didn't like, uh, why they participated, actually why they maybe didn't participate in Screen Plus. And that helps us to build further research opportunities and think about improving research. The second two are really what we're talking about today, which are quantitative parent surveys. Families get this about one month after uh, they receive their results from the study. Uh, it includes right now uh, three surveys, one on expanded newborn screening uh, and various newborn screening policy and program issues, one on dry blood spots. Uh, so there's actually two studies on expanded newborn screening, one on dried blood spots. We're working on a whole genome sequencing survey right now. But the idea is over a course of three to six months, families receive two to three surveys. They can choose to participate as many times as they want and as many surveys as they want and give feedback on a variety of newborn screening issues. We also have a component in the qualitative realm as well. So approximately six to two months uh, after uh, birth, families who received positive results from Screen Plus will be uh, entered into a qualitative data collection process where we're gonna be hearing from families uh, and hearing their narratives about their experience with newborn screening, about their experience with getting positive results uh, at a much more in-depth interpersonal level. These are gonna be hour, hour and a half long interviews. And the idea is to hear their stories, to hear what their, what their experience was like. And in a second, I'm gonna talk about why I think it's so important to hear both quantitative and qualitative data. The kinds of things we're gonna be talking about, as I said before, so we're gonna be asking parents about consent, dried blood spot retention, uh, newborn screening expansion, including what types of disorders we might wanna screen for in the future, including age of onset, treatability, diagnostic and prognostic uncertainty questions, and issues related to newborn screening that may fit a little bit outside of our core kinds of questions like trust in government entities, trust in newborn screening programs, issues around equity and diversity, and what kinds of information should generally be returned from screening results. Our goals in all three of these data collection processes are to do a few things. One is just to inform newborn screening implementation, to think about meeting family needs and what kinds of resources may be necessary, and to hopefully impact newborn screening policy and newborn screening research. Those last two are interesting ones because they tend to be harder when it comes to integrating social science data into newborn screening policy development. So I want to talk just briefly. I, this is not meant to be a data presentation, but I, I, I'm an empirical researcher. I always have to show a little bit of data. Um, so I want to start by talking about the reason why I think it's so important to include both quantitative and qualitative data when considering social science research in newborn screening. So here's some data from one of our studies uh, looking at parental attitudes towards various ages of onset, uh, attitudes towards adding conditions with variable ages of onset to newborn screening. We asked whether or not they thought adding particular conditions that had either an early, late, an adult onset or conditions with no cure or treatment would be a positive thing, a negative thing, uh, or neither positive or negative. And as you can see from this very quick snapshot, 
A majority of parents thought that receiving information through newborn screening about conditions that might have an early onset, a late onset, or an adult onset tended to be a positive thing. There were some families that said there were neither, neither positive nor negative, and there were a few families that said this was a negative thing. There were about 225 families in this survey. But this is the danger of data like this. We look at a screenshot, we look at, a, at, a, at some statistics, and we try to think about how that might impact policy without better understanding the nuances of how families feel, what families are going through when thinking about these issues, we're missing important details about their experience, about their voice, about their, about their lives. These kinds of screenshots, these kinds of data are incredibly important to start, but they really have to be the start. Once you start looking at in-depth data from families' experiences, we see the nuance, the complexity that takes place in these issues for families. So here's a few quotes. Whether the treatment is available or not, it's always preferable to know if there's an issue. Someone else said, I have a genetic condition that was not diagnosed in adult health. I think it would have been very beneficial to know at a younger age. But we also heard from some families that said prior to having children, I would have felt that newborn screening for any disorder would be positive. Now that I have a child, I'm not sure I would wanna know that information about a disorder that may or may not affect my child for several years or into adulthood, if at all. Especially if there are no treatments or currently anything that I could do differently to lessen the severity or delay onset, right? So the reason why I think it's important to have this nuanced data is to better hear from families and better understand why our policies also need to reflect that complexity, also need to reflect that nuance. Context, context, context. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to talk about today is how important how we ask questions are to our final product, to our outcomes, to what we're including in our data. So first, this is some data showing uh, families' experiences with um, families' attitudes towards getting newborn screening when there's some level of uncertainty. So we asked families in case, would, would you want a newborn screening results in cases where, the, where a child is at high risk to develop a serious condition that might need treatment, but doctors cannot tell when they will get sick? So potentially later onset. 92% of parents said they either strongly or somewhat agreed with get, wanting that kind of information, while 8% said they were uh, disagreed with that kind of information. So with that kind of uncertainty. We also asked, in, uh, would, would families be interested in receiving newborn screening results uh, uh, for conditions where doctors could not tell whether or not their baby would have a serious condition? And you can see a slightly different answer. 70% still strongly or somewhat agreed with getting that kind of uncertainty back. Um, but it's thinking about these different kinds of uncertainty is important, right? Are we talking about uncertainty with age of onset? Or are we talking about uncertainty with regard to actually having a condition? And we saw some really potentially really interesting different differences between parents' attitudes. Context is important if we think about what population or what community or who we're talking to. Take, take that first question again. Would you wanna get your baby's information regarding results that for example, uh, where a doctor might not be able to tell you whether or not you have a particular condition. Our white families in our study, uh, we saw 60% felt that they would either strongly or somewhat want that information, while 40% said they so strongly or somewhat disagree with the statement that they would want that information about an uncertain future condition. When we look at our non-white families in the study, that number was statistically significantly different, where 80%, a much higher number of families, non-white families, wanted that uncertain information, right? Interesting finding, I think, tells us a little bit of something about where we might see some trends with regard to acceptability of uncertainty, but we need to get deeper into that. And that's, we'll, we'll go that in, in a little bit. How we ask questions also change what kind of data we get. So in the first column here, we say, I would like to get my baby's newborn screening result in cases again, where my doctor cannot tell me if my baby has a serious condition back to those original numbers. But in a second survey, we asked people whether or not that, whether or not for uncertain conditions, whether or not they would think all babies should be screened in a mandatory fashion, or whether or not parents should be able to give permission or should actually be required to give permission. And that number changed drastically. We had about a 50-50, about 50% 50 of parents said they were fine with a mandatory screen for, for conditions that had high levels of uncertainty. While the other 50% said no, if there's a le that level of uncertainty, parents should have to give permission in order to receive those results. We need to think about how that changes the way we talk about screening. 
And finally, again, context with quantitative versus qualitative. So 70% said they would want uncertain information about a future condition. But again, very quickly, because I know my time is running out, we see very different opinions when we actually look at more qualitative in-depth data from families. This person says, the only thing that I would hate to add to a mom is additional worry. If there's any uncertainty about the serious condition and no possible treatment, it's honestly better to live in ignorance and enjoy your babies versus enjoy your baby versus always being worried and then one day they might get sick. Someone else said multiple doctor's visits in early, in early babies' lives are very stressful. Knowing that that might be coming or that, it's, uh, that there's a diagnosis would be valuable to help manage that uncertainty. Slightly different opinion. More information we have, the better. There's so many things that we don't know and can't predict about our own bodies and having the opportunity to know more about baby's health and probabilities is comforting. Right. Again, this is all to kind of show the, it can, the, the importance of embracing the complexity of these kind of data. So how do we move forward? The last couple of slides. How do we move forward on these things? So let's go back to my original challenges. So challenge one is the fact that we just don't have enough data and that the data that's sometimes presented is either anecdotal or hypothetical. We need to work together to co-create research questions, whether that's the committee with our, with our advocacy organizations, whether that's state health programs with parents, we need to work together to create questions that I think can move us forward. We need to develop research that includes LC and social science methods, and we need more funding. A lot of funding opportunities in newborn screening exclude the kind of work that we're doing, exclude social science data. For challenge two, how do we make sure that data is not dismissed as non-scientific? We have to create new opportunities for presenting and integrating social sciences like panels like this. We really appreciate uh, being able to have a panel like this and develop training opportunities in newborn screening for programs to work with social science data. I think there's lots of amazing training opportunities. And finally, this is probably the hardest. How do we make sure that data is actually systematically integrated into our evidence review? We need to further develop decision matrices for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of decisions that integrate value in social, data, social science data more more uh, effectively. And it may be that these data are not meant to say this is to decide yes or no screening a particular condition, but thinking about how we can inform processes. What kinds of resources do parents need? What kinds of things are of a concern of, of, of families? That, that addressing challenge three is going to be the hardest. I think this is going to be the, one of the challenges for the committee moving forward is how can these kind of data be integrated? Um, the reality is you're always going to have divergent and pluralistic views among parents, right? You're always going to have a parent who is very concerned about uncertainty. You're going to have some parents that are more comfortable with uncertainty. That's not a failure of the data. That's just a reality. That's the reality of families' experiences that you're going to have this kind of divergent views. So we need to find better ways to include those divergent views. We need to think about determining thresholds for potential harms more, uh, more effectively. We need to think about weighing screening versus clinical harms and what that means in terms of families' experiences. We need to value data uh, that may uh, indicate not just whether or not something should be screened, but whether or not it's about improving resources. And finally, we need to consider how we hear from families and thinking about permission. So I wanna end by talking about two just very, very quick things. One, which is that um, we need to think about not just ways that we can appreciate social science data, but ways that we can really uh, um, improve the data that we're integrating. Um, this is some, some, some core principles from Arthur Lupia, a political science, a wonderful political scientist at the University of Michigan, who does a lot of work um, on how do you in improve and include social science data in policymaking. And he really talks about four core principles that I think we can use as a benchmark for the ways in which we consider these kind of data. The first one is rigor. How do we know what we know? The ability to be able to explain how we're understanding complex issues, especially when there are divergent uh, um, questions, when there are controversies, when there are uh, disagreements among committee members. We need to think about rigor and how we uh, include the, these kind of data. Of course, ethics and ethical research, how do we make sure we're empowering our participants and our families uh, to feel comfortable talking with us about their experiences? We need precision in measurement and conceptualization. If seven of us are doing research and all seven of us have different definitions of harms, that's going to be very hard to integrate into the, what we do on a daily basis here. So we need much more precision and, and, and shared conceptualization of things like benefit, harms, disparities. And finally, causality. 
If we think about correlation and we see disparities, for example, in outcomes in newborn screening between white and non-white families, some data that's been presented here before, we need the ability to think about what's causing that th those disparities. If we're gonna solve problems, like disparities in newborn screening, we really need to focus our, our, our efforts on really improving our understanding of causal features and causal nature, uh, causal uh, um, causality for, for those disparities. And finally, let's not reinvent the wheel. There are many of us in this room, there are many of us online, there are many of us in the world who have done really amazing work in this space. Um, and I think we need to, maybe do a better job of recognizing the work that is already out there. For example, many of us in this room worked on a paper just a number, just a few years ago on evaluating harms in the assessment of net benefit and created a new framework for thinking about harms, not only to individual newborns, but to parents and families. This project was meant for us to think about expanding the ways in which we think about social science data, the ways in which we think about harms and 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 how we can expand our our notions of harms and our definitions of harms and i think we should be pulling these papers back out and really thinking about them in the work that we do we don't have to do this alone we don't have to do this um uh, uh without some amazing work that's already been done and i think that's an opportunity to do that and to to hear from families who have already dedicated so much time into talking to us about their experiences so I'm going to end there. I'm um, uh, happy to open it up to questions uh, for both uh, Dr. Ackerman and myself. I want to acknowledge the Screen Plus team uh, and NICHD for funding for this project, as well of our, as our industry partners um, and many of my colleagues who have helped me think through many of these issues as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. You got me thinking. I'm going to start with a maybe less of a question, but more of a comment. Uh, um, grade, you know, grade, grade is a is a evidence to decision framework for evidence synthesis and recommendation creation, and they have created a model that's been lightly used called grade circle, which is an approach of trying to marry or bring together different uh, data streams, uh, marrying both the quantitative and the qualitative and going from the evidence to decision framework. Um, on a NASM committee I chaired, we use that plus another emerging area, uh, which maybe you're already doing, which is qualitative data synthesis, which is saying, now I'm gonna combine data across qualitative studies, which is, uh, pretty well established in Europe, but just kind of coming to the US now. And I'm thinking about that study because it thought about all, how to incorporate many different kinds of data streams in the evidence to decision uh, framework and something, Jeff, we might ask if the statement of task is not already set for NASM, that could they expand the statement of task to look at the use of grade circle or other integrative data stream evidence decision frameworks that could make sure we're not excluding this. The only reason I bring it up is because it does what you're talking about the way you're talking about doing it in, in a um, structured way. I can't tell you, Aaron, that it's the right structured way, but it is a structured way. Yeah. And no. I think it would be used. So that was my comment to kind of get us started. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, one of the issues is when you have one study with 10 families, that data is incredibly important and it's incredibly meaningful. We want to listen to those families. But when making public health policy, being able to synthesize data across multiple studies is, is crucial, right? Thinking about individuals and families in different situations and different communities, different geographic locations. Um, I think now that there's a larger effort by the NIH and other uh, other entities to do more data sharing of qualitative data, I think there's really great opportunities to think about looking across studies at some of these themes and doing thematic analysis in really unique ways. So I absolutely agree. Thanks, let me open up to other questions from the committee and I see Jennifer's card is up. Um, so I'd like to start with asking um, Ned, how should we uh, think about our time to discuss these, these two very excellent and thought-provoking talks, um, given that um, 
it may give us only 20 minutes for lunch and that's how long it takes me to get through the line. <laughs> we will we will do our best to, to do as much uh, discussion and leave as much time for lunch to get you through the line. Okay, well, we're already, I think we're over time. Am I, am I misreading this? Yeah, we're just going oh, right here. Oh, we're here fine. we go. Oh, okay, good. Sorry. I, I believe like, we're okay. I, I no think idea. we have at least I misread the, 20 yeah, minutes. So eager for lunch, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought, yeah, we're. No, but these are both excellent talks. And I guess what I would say is I really like the way you married the qualitative data to the quantitative. And I would just put in um, a comment that these are consented studies. Yes. Yeah and um, that the real quantitative data that we should have and we don't have and may never have um, can only come from long-term follow-up data collected on children who actually screen positive. So that, that's all I will say. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And there are a number of studies. Beth Trini presented our, our work on one of the last, uh, you know, last uh, committee meetings uh, on following families for a year after receiving uncertain results and with an uncertain prognosis. And one of our goals is to do exactly what you're what you're referring to, which is to follow families more long term to really follow up with families about their experiences and to do so across really over a year, year of time, rather than, you know, a lot of studies are snapshots, right? They are snapshots and we get, this gets back to the issue of a good day or a bad day. Are you talking to people on a good day or a bad day? And what, how does that impact their responses on a survey or their responses on an interview? Um, one of the reasons why we set up our study the way we did is to give an opportunity to talk to families over time, to hear from them over time. Um, knowing that family stress, for example, increases right before they need to go in for follow-up, right? They may, might decrease after, you know, after that appointment. And so depending on where you're talking to families in their kind of post-diagnosis um, um, clinical process, you're going to get different answers. You're going to get different experiences. And so being able to talk with families over time um, is really important. Now, at the same time, it also means respecting their time. Families have a lot on their minds. They have a lot going on. And um, spending three hours or four hours with you to talk about their experiences means that's time away from their kids. That's time away from their work. So also balancing, wanting to hear from those families and respecting their time is, is something that we talk a lot about in our work. If I can, and if I can just jump in to add to, to what Aaron just said, um, we, we also um, use qualitative uh, methods interviews to understand families' responses to surveys. Um, so just what Aaron just said about context really matters in terms of interviews and surveys. So we actually had uh, conducted a survey with the families in our studies around uh, whether they were willing to share their data or not with a national um, data repository. And then later, when we interviewed them, we asked them, do you remember making a decision about data sharing? Quite often they said, no, I didn't. And we said, well, if you, if you were to choose now, what would you, would you say yes or no? And very often their response was the opposite of what they had answered on the survey. And we realized that they were under a lot of duress. They were in a clinic setting. They were, the, the question was framed in a certain way. So we realized that, that our survey really didn't get at families' actual preferences. So that's another kind of mixed methods way to, to sort of help fine tune survey questions. Thanks, thanks, I have Jeff. So one quick question to your, your question, one quick answer, Jennifer, is that, this is Jeff Brasco from MRSA, is that we are hoping that, that Aaron's and Sarah's presentation this morning would be examples of the kind of evidence that can be useful, not that they're definitively answering questions this morning. And so this afternoon, when we, we talk about expanding the way we use evidence in decisions for the, for the committee, um, this would be examples of the kinds of things that could be done. You wanna answer before I go to my next point? <laughs> oh yeah, and I guess I just wanna respond that people who consent to participate and who participate in these studies are very different from people who don't. And I think that the real harms um, the, the data on real harms we just don't get because the people who are harmed don't come. Uh, we may have a future presentation um, from Rachel Grob, who is, uh, she's done some stuff in the newborn screening, now does more generally the patient experience. And in her, I'm, 
I'm going to mess this up, I'm sure, but in her scientific approach to focus groups, instead of getting to consensus and then kind of stopping, it's what are the, what are the minority views that come out and then really teasing those out. Mm -hmm. So there are some scientific approaches to getting to the typically unheard voices, and that may be something for us to consider. Um, I'm actually going to then turn to Sarah. My question for you, Sarah, is you mentioned ethnographic approaches, and you're, you're a methodological expert. Could you say a little bit more about how that might differ from just, say, interviewing someone with a structured interview or what I just mentioned, what, what Rachel's doing? Can you just tell us a little bit more about the different kinds of ways that interviews might lead to different information? Oh yeah, thanks. That's that's a great question. And before I answer that, just to just to respond to the previous comment, a lot of the families in our study, even though it was a consented study, they were they didn't even remember they were in a research study. The reason they were in the study is because it was the only way they were going to get access to sequencing because Medicaid did not pay for it. So just to, just to say that it was a very unusual study in that sense that uh, we would ask families and they'd say what research, you know, even though they went through the consent process, they were so focused on on the clinic, you know, possible clinical and, and personal benefit. But to, uh, to get back to your question, Jeff, um, so I think I would just highlight um, one, one particular real difference in ethnographic research versus maybe standard uh, interview focus group research. And that is that we were actually able to observe uh, the clinical interactions uh, between families um, and and the clinical team and researchers, and that really helped us to understand that this idea of personal utility isn't something that families um, they it's not something they have. It's not something that lives in them. It's something that's actually created in interactions. So I think and, and the same thing when before the pandemic, we were actually able to go visit families in their homes when we did research. We asked them, would you? Would you like to do the interview on, um, in, you know, in our uh, office, in a public place, or at home? And they usually said home. We traveled all over uh, the Bay Area to visit people, and we learned a lot about their day-to-day -day life just by being in their homes. They often showed us um, where their child um, slept, and they showed us, you know, a lot of these families ex were experiencing extreme um, employment and housing precarity. Uh, so we actually got a glimpse into the day-to-day -day lives of the families that enabled us to understand and contextualize what they were telling us in a way that if we had just talked to them on the phone would never have been possible. So there's a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Online we have Ash. Uh, this is Ash Lau, committee member, uh, UCSF. Um, I um, really appreciate the, the presentations today. Uh, thank you for discussion of a very difficult topic. Um, my first observation, just as a comment from being a clinician, is that to add to the complexity of diagnostic uncertainty is the issue of um, uh, phenotypic variability and clinical expression of monogenic diseases. So even when we know that there is a definite association, you're talking to families and trying to describe the future course, um, um, there, there are limitations even within that that add to <clears throat> how families perceive the uncertainty around the future of their child. So um, I don't know if that's an additional thing that um, might need to be added to um, you know the the counseling that the families initially receive, um, not just the genetic diagnosis, but the, the variability of clinical course in the future. Um, sickle cell is a good example of that, um, but there are many. I'm sure there are many other conditions. My my question um, 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 is regarding the uh, maybe. To, Dr. Goldenberg is the the questions that are being asked about the family's perception um, of uncertainty in genetic genetic diagnosis. Do you think that um, if the same question said as a just as a thought experiment would have been asked say 20 years ago versus now, uh, would you have received uh, would the answers be somewhat different? Um, given the recent advances in the 
in the field of genomics as well as precision medicine and the filtering out of um, successes or some early successes in gene therapy, et cetera, and how that um, shapes the public's view um, of um, genetic diagnosis and prediction. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm not sure if they'd be different. I think even 20 years ago when there was still a lot of un, uncertainty about uncertainty or, or, or lack, you know, less information about the kinds of genetic results that families could receive, I still think families' expectations about what they might hear from screening might have been the same. I do think that, you know, back in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when studies like this were being done on um, Alzheimer's disease genetic testing and Huntington's disease genetic testing, there tended to be a lot of data that showed pretty significant um, uh, potential psychosocial harms to families, anxiety to families. And a lot of that hasn't borne out in more recent genetic testing kinds of social science data. A lot of families um, have shown a lot more resiliency and a lot more interest in even when receiving uncertain results and having some comfort in uncertainty. Um, even though we know we can, we, we're worried about the potential harms of uncertainty. Um, I think even in some of the families that we've been speaking to, we've heard about, you know, that it's less about the harms of uncertainty and more about the resources that families need to address uncertainty and to deal with uncertainty. And so, you know, maybe families would have thought different 20 years ago than they do now, but I think right now what we're hearing from most of the families in a variety of our studies is less about, well, I don't want uncertain information or, or, or I do want it, but more if I get uncertain information, how are you going to help me? What kinds of resources are going to be there to help guide me? Um, how can our family cope together? Uh, in order to to address what that uncertainty looks like. And that includes what you mentioned before, which is that includes when there's phenotypic variability. So even if they have a diagnosis and there's phenotypic variability, families want to know, well, what kinds of things can we be doing to look out for particular symptoms or particular things that might reflect that we don't know what an outcome might look like. There's that kind of prognostic uncertainty that we're hearing. Um, Dr. Ackerman, I know you, you've thought a lot about these issues too. I don't know if you wanted to weigh in as well. I think you expressed it wonderfully. Yes, I, I agree about the high tolerance in our our study population, high tolerance for uncertainty. Um, but but a, not only a desire for help in managing that and, and obtaining services to help them, but also um, a, a real wish that they would be followed uh, by the, cl the clinical team. And so many of the families in our study knew that that was unlikely. Um, because uh, they did not have access to clinical genomics care in general because of where they lived, because of their insurance. And so it was a sense that they they dipped their toe into this elite world of, of very advanced medicine, and then they went out the other side, and they didn't know what was going to happen after that. And that I think that was particularly unfortunate, um, given uh, a lot of these families' day-to-day -day lives um, of struggle. So that was, I think that's something that I feel like is a real un unanswered question, not just what researchers' ethical obligations are to study participants after the research ends, but overall, what is our, what is our obligation um, to families who may not actually have easy access to follow-up care and to help resolve their uncertainty, potentially gain a, a more concrete answer someday as genomic science advances? Michelle? Hi, Michelle Kajana, committee member. Um, thanks, Dr. Ackman and Dr. Goldenberg for those talks, um, things that we think a lot about in newborn screening. And I agree that these studies are pretty much looking towards the consented population. And it sort of reiterates my question to Dr. Bailey about how you kind of get the, the full landscape. And I think um, within the world of newborn screening, the word of the decade for us, at least, has been harmonization. We've been trying to harmonize what we do, how we call results, how we count conditions, what a positive screen is, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering, with Screen Plus being a relatively large data set that's going to get larger, is this a good opportunity to harmonize how these studies are set up to get family perspectives? And like you said, it's important when a question is asked, how it is asked. And I think the answers also depend somewhat on how the information is actually delivered from the healthcare system to the family, 
and hooking up to those services. So I'm wondering if there's any space to be able to set up some sort of a model that could be then used and, and you know, put forth into the evidence review based on the types of data that you've both collected. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think absolutely. I think there's an opportunity, just like as we do with clinical data, to think about harmonization, right? There's always this balance between harmonization and context, right? That we always have to be thinking about, which is on one hand, we want harmonization, we want precision, we want shared understanding of our definitions. And at the same time, you want studies to be able to ask questions the way that they need to for their research questions, right? For the, their goals or for their particular population or for their communities that they're working with, asking questions. I use this as an example sometimes, you know, asking questions around trust in government in Flint, Michigan looks very different than, uh, you know, even down the road in Ann Arbor. Um, and we need to be able to be thoughtful about that and, and, and think about that. At the same time, I think harmonization across sites is really important. And I, I actually, I love the idea of a kind of a platform that we work on together that we share that might help to inform the decision matrix. Um, you know, and I'll say that I think even though these studies are consented, um, we have found that there's a lot of families who maybe did have bad either experiences or bad outcomes who felt like there's never been an opportunity to talk about that, to have, who feel like they, they haven't been heard or that there haven't been opportunities to talk about their stories as well, right? We, it, that, that, that only success stories have been heard. Um, and I think these studies do have an opportunity, while I think it is a challenge, to, to bring in those, those maybe less heard voices. Um, and, and I have found in, in a lot of the work that we do that families who maybe have had, felt like they've been harmed or wronged by programs, want to talk about it and want to, you know, you know, even though, um, it may be difficult or even though it may be um, a little bit different than the kinds of conversations that, that we're normally having in this space. Um, and I think we can do more of that. I think we can hear from those families a little bit more. We, so we conducted a, um, a, a kind of supplemental study where we interviewed community-based service providers, including uh, special education teachers, occupational therapists, regional center directors, and others, and asked them, um, you know, if you if if you um, encountered a child that just you know had an etiologic diagnosis with a very rare condition that you didn't know much about, um, what would you do with that information? You know, they almost without exception said, "Look, if it's if it's a condition that I know, um, maybe that would be helpful. But if it's just a really rare rare disease or, or condition that um, it doesn't add much to my functional assessment." Um, you tell me what I can do with it. <laughs> so, so there was really a sense that the knowledge, the, the sort of knowledge emerging out of advanced genetic technologies is, is not being integrated or is not, there isn't really any understanding of how to integrate it with existing approach, approaches to assessment in schools and, and in other community settings. So that's, that seems to be a real need, um, especially if we're gonna be finding more and more rare variants, more and more rare conditions, how are we going to integrate those different types of knowledge? Because otherwise, you know, we heard from people that, look, <clears throat> that's very interesting, but I, I don't really see how that's going to change what I've already figured out that this child needs in terms of their developmental tra trajectory. Janika? Janika Ponpetkun, committee member. I have a, a specific um, question for Dr. Ackerman about this study. Um, so the consent that was obtained, um, I, I, what struck me was the um, family reported that they did not know that or didn't recall the yield of this um, positive outcome or variant of uncertain significance. Um, could you just share um, how was um, who obtained the consent um, for that? Because I, you know, for us who do genetic testing all the time, exome sequencing. Um, we have wonderful, you know, genetic counselors who focused on, you know, making sure that those are some of the um, key part of um, talking to the family. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So we also had really talented genetic counselors um, uh, and clinical research coordinators who are obtaining consent it maybe it would help to explain some of the context. And this is another advantage, I think, of ethnography. We were in the room quite often uh, watching this process. So, so many of our families um, required a medical interpreter 
to be present, but often, you know, this was being done by video interpretation. So there was a device in the room. Uh, families often brought um, their affected child and their other children. So the room, the, the, the small clinical exam room was packed full of people. Um, the consent form was, it was lengthy. Um, there were surveys to be asked. I think it was an overwhelming experience for families. And I think they were really singly focused on, yeah, I want this test. This might help us, you know, end our search. Um, and so whatever, you know, just let's get through this, you know. And so I think it was conducted in a very rigorous way. But I think the family's priorities and values were, were not as much focused on the research. And this is another area. It's interesting. This the, the clinical research uh, distinction is really blurred in a lot of this emerging genomics research where, you know, you have to have families sign both a HIPAA uh, form and a consent form because the, the research is generating clinical data as well as research data. So it's a lot for families to go through. It's a lot to expect them to remember, especially when there's a language barrier. So I really think all of those things collided to make this process not always as clear and comprehensible to everyone as we would have liked. Thank you. And just a quick question, um, which Dr. Ehrenberg kind of mentioned a little bit. Um, is there tools to measure resiliencies from social science? Thank you. Yes, I'll very quickly, because I know there's, we're running out of time. Um, there are a number of tools that measure resiliency. There are a number of tools that, were, were, that measure um, tolerance to uncertainty. Um, there's some really amazing tools and, and measures out there. I think they are all underutilized. And I can say, speaking as a social scientist that's worked on developing tools, we want people to use our tools. We want people to use the work we're doing. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out best ways to get them, to get them used because you know, these are validated measures that are really fantastic. Sean. Thank you. And I, I want to echo what others have said. This was a really great presentation this morning, this whole session. So thank you. Uh, a, a quick question, I think, for both uh, Dr. Goldenberg and Dr. Ackerman <clears throat> related to context and the tolerance for uncertainty. It seems to me in the data that you both presented that we we examine tolerance for uncertainty in sort of an unselected population. We examine tolerance for uncertainty in a group of patients that have already develop tolerance to uncertainty because they've been living with an undiagnosed condition for some period of time. What we haven't addressed is tolerance for uncertainty in a group of people who actually experienced it when they didn't expect to, which is the newborn screening situation, right? You have a newborn baby, you get a test done, you have no idea the test was even done, and then somebody comes in and says, here's a result, we don't really know what it means, we need to need to see what's gonna happen over the next few years. How do we address the tolerance for uncertainty among that population specifically? Or maybe it's been done and I just missed it. Yeah, I'll just very quickly say that uh, there haven't been as many studies that have done that, um, there have been a few. Um, the work of uh, Stefan Timmermans and Mark Bookbinder did that uh, in their book, Mob Now, maybe 10 years ago, um, the, the work that Beth and I are working on and others in the room, um, some of the work that Don's worked on before has talked to families directly after about what their experience was like getting an uncertain finding. I think the numbers of families getting uncertain results is going up. Um, uh, and that's actually the, the study that Beth presented, that uh, Dr. Trini presented at the last meeting is exactly to do that, to capture families, to talk to families right after receiving that information, both quantitatively and quanti qualitatively, and then to follow them over a course of a year both quantitatively and qualitatively to see what that kind of the initial shock of getting on certain information might be, and then what that looks like in terms of coping mechanisms in a, in a much longer term uh, uh, fashion. So I think it's I think that's incredibly valuable um, and needed. And I think the same thing is happening in the larger kind of genomics space. Dr. Ackerman, I know you know this, this, this even better, kind of thinking about talking to people who all of a sudden are placed in a situation of uncertainty. Yeah, so I think our prenatal population may be more analogous um, to the newborn screening scenario. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to be able to interview some of the families who decided not to undergo 
prenatal sequencing. And it was partly because they just found it overwhelming. It was too much information. It was too much uncertain information, um, too unclear to them how they should act on it. If the pregnancy was far enough along that termination wasn't really, didn't feel like an option for parents. They just felt like, let's just wait until my child is born and then we can handle this. This is too much right now. But that was actually quite a small minority. So most of the families still, you know, decided to continue with sequencing. Um, and amazingly, we're pretty resilient in receiving uncertain information. But the, what was hard for them was being faced with that during what was already a difficult pregnancy, and then having questions about future reproductive decisions that really couldn't easily be answered for them at that time. And I think they found that very stressful. So I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. Um, it, it probably was harder for that population, I think, than our prenatal families who had years of experience uh, not knowing uh, what caused their child's condition. Natasha, last question. Hello, Natasha Bonham, Genetic Alliance. Um, to the point on uh, uncertainty, I, I think it's great that we are really starting to focus in on that. Um, but, you know, newborn newborn screening doesn't necessarily, or even genomics, doesn't really have a um, an outsized share in terms of uncertainty. Uh, we look at, you know, you, you have pregnancy and you go for your typical ultrasound and then wait, what do you mean something's there? Or you have a smooth pregnancy, it was great and wonderful. And then all of a sudden your child in, is in the NICU. So I think really as we are hopefully having more of these pro, uh, projects, looking at uncertainty and newborn screening and, and genomics, we're putting it in an even larger context of what does uncertainty look like um, in medicine and when you're going through these different journeys. That wasn't my question, that was a comment. But um, uh, my uh, kind of two questions or comments uh, for are for uh, Dr. Ackerman. Um, so when you, the population you focused in on, you're looking at um, underserved groups, correct? And then you focused on groups that were um, through Medicaid, Medicaid, is that correct? Well, yeah, um, California doesn't really have many under under uninsured children. Okay, um, I, I I actually thought of this first with um, Dr. Bailey's presentation, and then again with yours. Um, so often when we're talking about underserved, it seems to be really focused on from first and foremost an economic lens, and yet we do know that there are plenty of people who are underserved by our medical systems who, um, you know, have insurance and have all of that. Our maternal mortality crisis in this country is a clear um, viewpoint on that. I just didn't know if you had any opportunities maybe to compare groups who maybe are not economically disadvantaged, but still, um, you know, medicine is not necessarily serving them or they're not getting the outcomes. Kind of same thing I'm thinking about when, as for uh, Dr. Bailey's presentation in terms of family outcomes that underserved can mean a lot of things. It's not just from an economic perspective. And just if you had done any work or thinking of doing any work or any other works, is happening to come to that. Great question. I have way more to say about that than we have time for, but to just short answer to say yes, we struggled with NIH's uh, definition of underserved, um, relying on, on um, <clears throat> the, the underserved, medically underserved areas category. Um, it, anyway, yes, we, we really struggled to conceptualize what are we talking about when we say underserved? We think we did not reach the truly underserved because a lot of those families were not referred to our study or could not travel to be in it. And we know this to be true, especially for our prenatal study, because the demographics in the pediatric arm and the prenatal arm were completely different. So we actually had much uh, more privileged families enrolling in the pre prenatal arm. There are a lot of reasons we can talk about why that might have been. But we are, we're very concerned that we certainly don't think we reach the truly underserved um, in either arm, but especially the prenatal arm. And these are people who either aren't obtaining good prenatal care, they maybe didn't get a prenatal ultrasound, which is required um, you know, to, to be referred to the study. So um, 
I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. And then I alluded earlier to the capacity of our community um, hospital partners to actually participate in this kind of testing was really limited. So and this is where a lot of, uh, of folks, not just economically underserved, but a lot of folks end up getting care um, is in community settings. Uh, so there are so many dimensions to what we might mean by underserved. And so we actually, it, the LC team stopped using that term. We just started talking about who was who in our study population, what their characteristics were, and who we thought we were not actually um, uh, connecting with and why. Thank great, you thank that. you. And I'll just mail you my other questions. So. Okay, that's thank great. Thanks. Thanks, Natasha. These were great as people have said presentations. I think really uh, added to what we're thinking about in terms of what kind of information can inform us in the harms and benefits area, how we can best capture those and weigh them. And hopefully we can move forward. We'll have more discussion this afternoon. That I'll turn things over to Leticia who will discuss lunch. <laughs> this is for you, Jennifer. Uh, as I stated earlier uh, this morning, the cafe is straight ahead there. The line shouldn't be that bad today since it's a Monday. Um, there's also a shop where you can pay via credit card self-pay over there that has sandwiches and chips and, and drinks of sort. Um, so please return here by 1 p.m. and we'll start the afternoon off with public comments. Thank you. If we can find our ways back to our seats. Great. During our, our meeting these couple days, right? Have, during our meeting these couple days, we're going to actually have two public comment periods. Um, one today with 10 oral public comments and then uh, comments uh, for tomorrow, uh, specifically around crab A disease. We also received four written comments that were shared with the committee previously as our materials were sent out. I'm uh, asking that in the order that I have folks on my sheet, you come up to this microphone and um, present to the committee, and I appreciate you all being here. We're going to start with uh, Maria Cathalas, who is online. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. My name is Maria Kapalas, the co-founder of CureMLD, an advocacy group that works on behalf of children impacted by metachromatic leukodystrophy. Two days ago on January 27th, it was the 10 year anniversary of the death of Loie Hammond. She was the only daughter of my dear friends, Matt and Lauren Hammond. Loie received her MLD diagnosis on Christmas Eve and she, and she succumbed to the disease three years later. Because the disease attacked Loie's GI system, even with a G-tube, her doctors could not find a way to feed her. She could, that was the main reason for her death. In the final years of her life, the only thing that brought Loie any relief was being held in her parents' arms. MLD parents of untreated children will tell you how the most reliable medicine we have for this disease is holding our children letting them hear our hearts beat against their ears and telling them over and over again how much they are loved. But this year, instead of celebrating Loie's 14th birthday, Loie's parents are counting down the days until FDA approval for OTL 200, 
a miraculous gene therapy that will ensure that no child suffers as Loewe did. Experts call it one of the most transformational gene therapies ever invented. ML need, but for gene therapy to work, MLD needs to be diagnosed at birth since gene therapy cannot reverse the damage to the brain and central nervous system. In the coming months, the members of this board will have it in your power to transform MLD into this generation's polio. It is in your power to make MLD a footnote in medical textbooks. There is no doubt the ACHDNC will come to see RUSP, the RUSP approval for MLD as one of the most singular achievements of newborn screening in the United States during this era of genomic medicine. We in the MLD community are ready to honor the children we have lost. This is Loewe's legacy. It is time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maria. And thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Next, I have Paul Orchard, who's also via the internet. Paul, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to the, the group today. I'm, I'm Paul Orchard. Uh, I'm a pediatrician trained in hematology, oncology, blood marrow transplant. And I wanted to talk uh, also about metachromatic leukodystrophy today. So my clinical interest is the use of cellular therapies as treatment for rare inherited life-threatening disorders. Uh, over the years in Minnesota, we've transplanted approximately 50 patients with MLD. It's very clear to me that transplantation is not curative. In addition, the morbidity and mortality of transplant has been high. 15 to 20% of the patients die actually going through the, the procedure. So we clearly need uh, something better. Fortunately, as Maria had, had mentioned, an alternative therapy is becoming available. It's an ex vivo lenti gene therapy approach utilizing the patient's own blood stem cells, introducing a normal copy of the aerosulfidase gene into the cells. Clinical trials in Europe have been compelling in terms of their data, and it's now licensed therapy in the EU. And I'm optimistic that it will soon become licensed therapy uh, in the US as well. The FDA is currently considering this and potentially as early as March, it may be approved. Uh, however, despite the potential for, the, for this new therapy, it became clear that uh, it's really the pre-symptomatic patients that are uh, gonna benefit, benefit from this. The vast majority of the patients that were treated in the clinical trials were second siblings diagnosed after uh, a prior sibling was symptomatic. For those symptomatic brothers and sisters, there's really nothing to offer, and those patients go on to die. So it's fundamentally important to identify these children as soon as, as possible. The ability to newborn screening uh, has been developed. It's been piloted in a number of places, including in Germany, where they identified uh, two children that went on to get gene therapy based on newborn screening. So in summary, I believe we'll soon have a safer, more efficacious therapy for MLD. But if we can't identify these patients in a pre-symptomatic state, they will not have access to it. Development of newborn screening for MLD is, in my view, critically important. And um, hopefully the addition to uh, the MLD to the RUSP will uh, be something that we can move forward uh, quickly. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paul. And finally, here in the room, we have Dean Sewer. Good afternoon, and thank you for letting me uh, speak to the committee and, and uh, the advisors here. Uh, I, on Paul Orchard's behalf, I'd like, just like to make a quick disclaimer. We love Paul. He's a transplanter. He is not affiliated with Orchard Therapeutics, so entirely separate entity. So he brings different information to the, to the table. Um, I wanted to talk about two things, uh, three things actually today. One is the Russ Brown table, which I've been mentioning the last couple of meetings. Uh, assuming that this committee meets in person in May, we'll be meeting on Wednesday before. You go to russramtable.org to learn more and to help contribute to our agenda if you want to participate. Rust alignment with MLD is, is really a reality for us. Every Life Foundation has been doing tremendous work bringing uh, nearly a dozen states on board with RUSP alignment, and they have several more. Uh, we were able to also do a RUSP alignment-like bill with the state of Illinois. So we'll, presuming that you all approve the nomination once it goes through the rigorous process, we'll have 51% of the babies in the U.S. screening because of RUSP alignment uh, efforts. 
And I think that's something to be uh, very proud of. But we know that RESP alignment is not a click your fingers thing. The real work is not in the legislature, it's at the state labs. And so we're gonna continue our work with the state labs to help them solve their issues and their concerns one by one by one as they uh, implement. I'm gonna skip over much of what's on the rest of this because you, uh, you heard this from Maria and Paul, Dr. Orchard. Uh, the MLD uh, newborn screening pilots continue both in the US and in Germany, over 200,000 babies screened. Four have been identified. Two of them have been on to therapy, but the therapy is not immediately at birth, it's months after birth. So um, uh, the third baby has not seen that therapy so far. There are publications that have been made and publications that are being uh, finalized. We froze the data on December 31st, anticipating this March uh, PDUFA FDA approval. And uh, of course that's a checkbox on the nomination form. So we hope to have our nomination with not only our data, but the FDA approval uh, later on in March. Uh, the only thing I'll say about gene therapy, and those of you that know me well, these words don't come out of my mouth easily, but it's all but curative. I probably won't ever say it's curative, uh, but when given pre-symptomatically, which is newborn screening to identify the patients, um, these children go on to live normal lives. They, they run, they walk, they, they are uh, intellectually and physically uh, you know, competent in, in comparison to all of our kids and uh, grandkids. Uh, so we are submitting the RESP nomination as soon as we can, again, pending the FDA approval and the summary of this data. We've got standards of care. We've got some genotype phenotype uh, correlation uh, data and, and information that's in place that will allow for uh, good positive referrals because we have multiple forms of the disease. So we look forward to uh, maybe the next time that we all meet together here that you might uh, might be voting or considering to be voting on uh, the MLD nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. We're gonna turn now towards public comments around the shins muscular dystrophy. I'm gonna start with EOT Baadwa. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a parent um, for a child who's 14 year old, a boy. His name is Ayan. He has uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. My son was diagnosed at the age of around three and a half. And this uh, particular disease is a most severe form of muscular dystrophy, which causes progressive uh, degeneration of the muscles. The general uh, progression of the disease is that they lose their ambulation by the time they are eight or nine, restricted to a wheelchair. They lose the function of their upper body by the time they are there in their uh, late teens, around 17, 18. And by the time they reach their early 20s, we unfortunately lose them due to their um, organ failures and their heart failure largely. This disease was uh, found in the uh, around 50 years back and the work has been ongoing on this since a long time. The current uh, therapies that have come into the market are exon skipping and gene therapy. The gene therapy that has uh, been recently approved is for four to six years old uh, by Sarepta. And Elvidus is the name of the product. It's fantastic. I have seen the videos and I have interacted with the children. And it's, uh, it's great to see uh, kids who are five-year-old and four-year-old who are running, jumping into the pool, and having a good time. Doesn't sound much to the rest, but when you see your child running for the first time, it's, you cry, you stand and cry over there because that's not something that you have ever seen. Unfortunately, with uh, this disease, the, uh, the progression reflects in a child when they are somewhere around seven years old or six years old. So getting access to this drug at the right time and at the right, uh, uh, you know, as early as possible is extremely critical. Newborn screening is going to probably change the trajectory of this disease completely for the kids. They will have a better quality of life and probably live a normal life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Paul Melmire. All right, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment uh, on the ongoing review of Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, for consideration for the recommended uniform screening panel. I am Paul Melmeyer. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. MD is proud to serve the Duchenne spinal muscular atrophy and Pompeii communities, along with many other rare neuromuscular disease communities. And actually on a note of celebration, uh, SMA is now screened for in all 50 states and DC, uh, which is an incredible milestone for the SMA community. 
Um, first and foremost, we're very grateful uh, for the committee's ongoing full evidence review of the Duchenne nomination, uh, particularly the work of Dr. Kemper and his team, as well as the technical expert uh, panel uh, on which MDA is represented. Uh, we look forward to continuing to contribute to the evaluation during these quarterly ACHD and C meetings, uh, the TEP and any other appropriate venue. The treatment landscape for Duchenne is only becoming more favorable. Uh, with about six months of experience now with Levitus, uh, that the Duchenne clinical field now has uh, in dosing four and five-year-olds uh, with Duchenne, we're very pleased that while access challenges have occurred, uh, to our knowledge, every barrier has actually been surmounted and each eligible boy prescribed to Levitus has successfully obtained the gene therapy. Access challenges have included Medicaid agencies, uh, slow walking the addition of a Levitus to their formularies. Commercial plans have considered a Levitus to be experimental. This is despite, of course, FDA actually approving the product. Uh, Self-insured plans have carved out gene therapies in their entirety from their formularies. And facilities have borne a really uh, quite the economic and financial costs by having to purchase the very expensive gene therapy and then under buy and bill having to seek reimbursement thereafter. Nonetheless, through very strong advocacy from the community, from groups like the Little Hercules Foundation, from PPMD, from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, each of these barriers have been overcome. In the last several weeks, we convened uh, many of the Duchenne clinical experts, uh, gene therapy prescribers in particular, uh, to discuss a variety of uh, challenges ongoing within gene therapy development and access. And what we heard pretty uniformly was uh, certainly a trend in positivity towards uh, the actual prescribing and access of Levitus, especially compared to when we convened the same group uh, just uh, last year. In addition, we're hearing from within our gene therapy support groups, uh, uh, stories similar to one you just heard about uh, boys running and swimming and jumping for the very first time in their lives and how meaningful that is, of course, not only to them, but to their families and to their entire support network. Uh, so with the Gamry soon hitting the market, the Flazacort soon going generic and the potential expansion of a Levitus uh, label beyond four and five-year-olds potentially later this year. Uh, additional therapies advancing through the pipeline. Clearly, the landscape of treatments for those with Duchenne has never looked brighter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I would like to turn um, online, starting with Jennifer Hant. Thank you, and good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Hant. My son, Charlie, age six now, was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy in late 2020, and I then learned that I am a carrier of his disease mutation. Before diagnosis, we spent the first thousand days of his life wondering why he was developing so slowly, why he wasn't crawling or walking or pulling himself up. We asked ourselves constantly, was it something to worry about? Our pediatrician told us repeatedly that it was probably nothing, and of course, we desperately wanted to believe her. So during those thousand days, we did things we now regret. We received physical therapy for Charlie through the Connecticut Early Intervention Program. Without a DMD diagnosis, we followed a protocol that pushed our baby's unprotected muscles too hard to catch up. Our baby, who couldn't tell us how difficult or even painful those exercises must have felt. It's heartbreaking to think about that now. During that time, our concerns kept us up at night. But we thought about the extensive newborn screening every baby goes through. Surely that would have told us if something was seriously wrong. We had no idea that what was going on, one of the most common genetic disorders in boys, was somehow not on that newborn screening for life-threatening diseases. So beyond the psychological burden of delayed diagnosis, which we absolutely experienced, why is this problematic? Right now, medicine is evolving at a rapid clip for DMD. We're at a crucial pivot point with transformative treatments approved and in trials. Yet even before these advances, high quality care alone has made a difference in DMD outcomes. Numerous studies have demonstrated that even in the absence of targeted treatments, coordinated care for DMD alone has resulted in a full 10 year increase in life expectancy. The sooner patients can get, diagnosis and get diagnosed and begin this care, the better. And the sooner we routinely screen babies, the sooner we can truly track how impactful early treatment really is. For us, once we finally got the diagnosis at age three, we got lucky. We got in with a certified care center quickly and got Charlie on steroids. He turned four at just the right time to qualify for the phase three trial of the gene therapy now known commercially as Elevitus. We are so grateful for the benefits of Elevitus that we have observed in Charlie so far. 
notable improvements in stamina and strength, even the loss of the hallmark Gower sign when Charlie gets up off the floor. But I often wonder what if that timing hadn't worked out so well, it should not have taken three years to get this diagnosis. What if instead he had turned six this past August without having had access to a levitus, which was approved for four and five-year-olds only? It's really hard to think about that now. As a levitus and other treatments become broadly available, a delay in diagnosis is unnecessary and harmful. It simply does not reflect the current state of science and medicine. There is absolutely no reason in 2024 for parents to play a guessing game or hope for lucky timing with potential treatments or clinical trials. Parents should have the power of knowledge to make the best possible decisions for their children. Duchenne is the most common pediatric muscular dystrophy. Modern medicine is on its heels, and the standard newborn screen is a critical tool we need to beat it. I urge you to add DMD to the recommended screening to let science lead the way and put an end to the guessing game that far too many families continue to play. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we have Bill Marshall. Try speaking again. Good afternoon. There you go. Okay. I'm a retired pediatrician. I have two grandsons who were recently diagnosed with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. My oldest grandson was 32 months old when diagnosed. It came as a shock. I'd had some concerns about motor development, but attributed this to normal variation in gait and milestones and perhaps some mild hypotonia. He'd received regular pediatric care, and aside from a hospitalization for respiratory virus, and had no major illnesses or developmental concerns. He was receiving physical therapy. The first year after diagnosis has been full of life altering decisions for our family. His physician scientist mother, his biophysicist dad have worked with amazing energy to get him the best medical care and care sought for their, his subsequently diagnosed little brother, Leo. Extended family and friends have offered and given physical and emotional and spiritual support. The past year has reinforced my support for newborn screening even more than clinical data and clinical experience. As I began my career in the 1970s, I saw that screening could do what traditional medical care did not, make an early diagnosis for treatable disorders. When congenital hypothyroidism, for example, had to be diagnosed clinically, it was often too late. Duchenne's is in an analogous situation today. Although the cure is not yet available, Treatment with established therapies like steroids, new medications like exon skipping drugs and gene replacement therapy, and other modalities showing great success. Beyond medical therapies, early recognition by newborn screening will give families the time and space they need to understand the diagnosis and plan for their new reality. Where to live, what home or apartment to live in, whether to have more children, are some of the decisions that must be made. As well, early diagnosis will prevent the misunderstanding, inappropriate treatment, and needless investigations. As the past year has shown our family, these challenges can be overwhelming. Newborn screening will allow all families to begin the steps needed to give their child the best care. I spent my years in pediatrics caring for children from underserved families. Real health equity can only begin when all newborns are screened and then have the prompt comprehensive medical care, therapy, and peer support that will make for the best outcomes. I've seen too many preventable poor outcomes in other disorders, such as misdiagnosis, lack of medication, interruptions in therapy, that often result from families' difficulties in navigating our very complex healthcare system. In summary, newborn screening offers the time families need for understanding a child's illness, the time for life realignments, and the time for early interventions with existing and new therapies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Aravindan Verapandian. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the uh, Duchenne clinician community, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So my name is um, Dr. Aravind Verapandian, where I also go by Dr. Panda for my um, patients. I'm an associate professor of uh, pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Arkansas Children's Hospital. I um, run the Comprehensive Neuromuscular Program here. I also lead our Certified Duchenne Care Center at Arkansas Children's Hospital, where we follow about 150 um, children with uh, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies. I am also the principal investigator for multiple uh, clinical trials for Duchenne, including 
the gene therapy trials from Region X Bio, Pfizer, Sarapta, um, and other downstream therapies such as CAP, ONO2, and Edgewise, et cetera. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy currently has seven FDA-approved therapies, two Duchenne-specific corticosteroids approved for all children ages two and up, and four mutation-specific exon-skipping therapies that are also available to all ages, and a gene therapy that was recently approved for children age four and five years. Another therapy is under um, FDA review and more than 20 potential um, therapies that are in clinical trials. At the typical age of diagnosis, children with Duchenne have muscle damage that is currently irreversible. When muscle tissue is replaced by fat and fibrosis, there is no known way to regain it. We have tried multiple alternative mechanisms to improve the age of diagnosis, to reduce the age of diagnosis. Um, the, the speakers before, uh, there was, it was, they were exceptional in terms of age of diagnosis. We are still diagnosing boys with Duchenne at age seven, age eight. Um, those mechanisms that we have tried are not working. They have not been successful. This is in stark contrast to the success of newborn screening. The benefits of newborn screening for Duchenne muscular dystrophy are exponential. It enables the implementation of the standards of care, which include early intervention services, and also considerations for corticosteroids early on. Newborn screen means children have access to newly approved therapies, disease modification therapies, including exon skipping and gene transfer therapy, much earlier in the disease process where there is less muscle damage and fibrosis. It also enables them to participate in the clinical trials without concerns of aging out. It gives family to learn about the disease and consider the therapy and clinical trial options. Uh, the newborn screen means that children um, have the diagnosis prior to starting their school, facilitating the evaluations and identification of learning disabilities and other cognitive issues prior to school start so they can have appropriate therapies and, and support. For the family, it allows timely genetic counseling, identification of carriers who are at risk for their own health concerns, earlier development of psychosocial support, and time to consider how to best incorporate the diagnosis into the family, which can also affect many downstream choices, such as housing and other support. We greatly appreciate the opportunity for Duchenne to be discussed again today, and thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Mindy Cameron. Hi, my name is Mindy Cameron, and I'm the mother of two sons, including a 22-year-old uh, son named Christopher who lives with Duchenne. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to talk about my support for including DMD on the federal RUSP. Newborn screening would make diagnosis, access to specialized care, and early treatment for affected children possible. Without it, babies born with DMD will miss the opportunity for the earliest and most effective interventions to substantially slow disease progression, thereby extending their ability to experience a more typical childhood, a more inclusive young adult life, and a better chance at survival into adulthood. We know improved health improves lives. This is no different in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. My son did not have the earliest interventions, and, he, and as he enters his final year of college as an undergraduate, he is entirely dependent on caregivers for the most basic daily living and self-care. I can't help but wonder what his current situation would be if he had had the opportunities that are available today. If his disease had progressed more slowly and he had been able to preserve and maintain some of his now lost capabilities, would he be able to lift himself out of bed and into his wheelchair on his own? Would he be able to prepare his own meals? Would he be able to even have a modicum of privacy when he has to use the bathroom or take a shower? Would he be able to take off his coat and hat when he arrives at class on a cold day? Would he have more years to enjoy his hobbies, develop relationships, and earn a living as a writer? But I remind myself that there were no early interventions when Christopher was born. There are now we have seven approved FDA therapies. Children born with DMD today have a very different journey, and I believe they should be given all the tools we have to flourish and thrive in the face of this truly diabolical diagnosis. In closing, I wanna add that newborn screening is also important so that the health of the mother can be assessed, monitored, and treated if necessary. I did not discover that I was a carrier of Duchenne until my son was nine. By the time I had my first cardiac MRI, when I was in my mid-40s, significant fibrosis consistent with DMD was found, and today I take three medications to help preserve the health and function of my own heart. My most recent MRI done just last month 
showed stability over the past five years thanks to these interventions. But I wonder if damage could have been diminished if I had started treatment earlier. We have extensive carrier screening now. We are beginning to gain traction in access to specialized care for carriers. Adding DMD to the rust would identify many carrier moms and the relevant family members earlier. Early intervention saves and extends lives and improves the health for everyone affected by this condition. I believe the time is right for the addition of Duchenne muscular dystrophy to the recommended uniform screening panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. And next we have Lauren um, Stanford. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, PPMD, and the Duchenne patient community, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Lauren Stanford, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at PPMD. We are grateful for the committee's continued full evidence review of the Duchenne nomination package. We look forward to continuing to help the committee in any way possible as they continue this review. Duchenne currently has multiple approved therapies and is in the middle of a dramatic of dramatic changes in treatment paradigms with more than 20 additional potential therapies in development. The approved gene therapy, Elevitis, is currently being dosed in four to five-year-olds and there is hope for an expanded label later this year. The approved treatments are effective, but they are also long-term. They require long-term treatment and then provide long-term benefits. Traditional outcome benefits are unlikely to be visible in early childhood for Duchenne because the typical development of disease, of disease course it would be so beneficial to find a cohort of boys diagnosed at or near birth and then follow them for five or 10 or near really 15 years, but that has not been possible in the past. Newborn screening for Duchenne would allow for these, those living with Duchenne to receive treatment earlier and then will be able to collect this data. Newborn screening saves lives, but current treatments for Duchenne are not cures. However, the available treatments do delay or slow muscle damage. And because they are slow, they are slow and delay muscle damage, we know they are going to get benefit from newborn screening. As far as how much benefit, it is going to take years to really know what that looks like. We've gotten survival to late 20, to the late 20s with our SOC treatment. Maybe we'll get another five, <clears throat> excuse me, five years of walking or 10 years of incredibly important upper extremity use or another 20 years of life. And every single one of those would make Duchenne newborn screening worth it. We, are, we hope that the committee will see the value in adding Duchenne to the rest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this ends our first public comment period. I, I want to thank everyone who came to the committee and shared your lived experiences, your family stories, and your expertise. It's an important part of federal advisory committees something we value and something we couldn't do our work well without that input. So again, my appreciation for everything that you do and you've done for the committee and newborn screening moving forward. Uh, as you all know, in August of last year, we voted DMD uh, to go forward for a full evidence review. And this afternoon and next, actually, we're gonna have a presentation from Dr. Uh, Alex Kemper uh, for the phase two part of the study. Uh, Dr. Kemper is the division chief of primary care pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. His research focuses on the delivery of preventive care services, including newborn screening. And since 2013, Dr. Kemper has served as the deputy editor of pediatrics. So we're so thrilled to have him here to present phase two update. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kalanch, and it's, it's a pleasure to be able to give an update with um, where we are uh, with our work. Getting an echo, too. I feel like the voice of God. Um, so I'll wait for that to get fixed to my slides to come back. Everything okay? Oh, sort of. Okay. Um, so... Um, with this update, uh, the, the primary goal is just to let you know where we are with um, evidence review. We're not going to drill in too deep um, to the evidence today because we want to make sure that when we come back at the next meeting, we can provide a full and balanced view about what is known instead of drilling into um, just small areas. 
Um, of course, I'd like to um, thank everybody who is a member of our evidence review group, um, as well as um, Dr. Dorley and Dr. Formfokul, who serve as the liaisons from the advisory committee to our work. Um, but perhaps most importantly, I want to thank our technical expert panel members who really help us, um, help guide us through the evidence um, and make sure that we understand things appropriately. We couldn't do our work without um, their involvement. So now for a quick update on our activities. Um, we've had uh, the first technical expert panel call back in October, and we're planning for a um, second call in um, February or March to go over where we are with the evidence review and make sure that we're understanding things appropriately. The literature review is in progress, um, as you might expect from um, about TMT, there's a much larger body of literature than there is for some of the other rare diseases that we've looked at within excess of um, 7,000 articles that we are uh, going through. We've um, begun the process of the public health system impact assessment. There was a webinar that was held on January 17th to um, review the salient features of Duchenne muscular dystrophy newborn screening with representatives from the state newborn screening programs. There's a survey that's open and it'll stay open for about a, another month. And we've just begun um, scheduling um, key um, uh, informant um, uh, interviews. Next, we're going to be um, also, uh, and this will begin with the next technical expert panel call, um, uh, discussing the decision analytic modeling that is um, asking ourselves what what might happen if you were to screen all 3.65 million newborns um, in the country each year for um, DMD. And then, of course, our plan is um, at the next meeting of the advisory committee to have the final evidence review. So in terms of <clears throat> newborn screening activity, I just do, do, do want to let you know that there are um, two states with legislation for DMD newborn screening. And in addition, in both um, Minnesota, uh, Arizona, and Illinois, there's a lot of activity that will likely lead to um, DMD newborn screening in the near term. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, the treatment. We uh, have heard um, previously about the um, FDA uh, approved therapies. This is a list of the um, uh, Exxon skipping um, drugs, which have received um, accelerated approval from the FDA. When you look at what led to the um, approval, uh, in general, it's a uh, mean change in dystrophin. So not necessarily a functional clinical outcome, but this biomarker of of mean change in um, dystrophin. You can see the years that these drugs were approved ranging from 2016 to 2021, the particular exon that skipped, a summary of the um, uh, pivotal studies that were done, and then um, clinical outcomes where they um, have been um, reported as part of the um, package leading to this um, FDA uh, accelerated uh, approval. Um, again, I just want to highlight that, that most of the focus has been on the mean change in dystrophin. So as you'll hear about uh, in a little bit, one of the things that's really important for us um, to be able to look at to inform the advisory committee is um, what we know about the relationship between biomarkers and um, functional outcomes. Uh, gene therapy, it's my goal that by the time I come back um, to present to the advisory committee that I can uh, pronounce the generic name for gene therapy, um, but don't hold me to that. Um, it, uh, the gene therapy received um, FDA approval uh, for children ages four and five. Um, you uh, heard a little bit about this um, from the public comment um, a little bit ago, and um, it's really critically important to think about where the, the approval uh, has been made because um, uh, uh, the uh, average age of um, uh, diagnosis would preclude um, gene therapy for um, many children. And um, uh, uh, based on registry data, it's clear that, that minoritized children have a longer average time to diagnosis, which could lead to important disparities in access to um, 
uh, therapy. There have been um, three main studies of um, uh, gene therapy. Um, and uh, interpreting some of these studies is, is difficult. There was a problem in one of the studies with the dosing error that reduced um, the um, effective sample um, uh, size. Um, there is a, uh, is listed here, a trend at 48 weeks among subjects four and five years old towards improvement in the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, which is a um, uh, standardized measure. But again, it's, it's complicated because of um, uh, uh, trends in the uh, NSAA um, uh, over time and exactly where things were looked at. And again, these are small studies that, that were um, uh, underpowered for some of the things that we might want to look at in terms of functional outcome. Um, uh, the uh, other main uh, medical therapy is um, glucocorticoids. Um, There's deflazacord, again, you heard about that a, a few minutes ago, which was FDA approved in um, 2017. There was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial for 12 weeks um, that had a, a, an extension. Um, and was associated with improved muscle strength compared to placebo in um, children who are five to 15 years of age. Um, and there was also another uh, randomized double blind um, placebo control trial that went into 104 weeks of treatment or loss of ambulation, uh, again, with older children, six to 12 years uh, of age, um, that showed a difference in the loss of uh, ambula uh, ambulation. And then, um, uh, uh, in addition to deflazacort, prednisone um, uh, can be used as a glucocorticoid for uh, treatments in children with um, DMD. It's typically started before the plateau phase, which is around four to five years uh, of age. So one of the things that, that you can see is some of these therapies, gene therapy, glucocorticoid therapy, don't happen in infancy, but, but really... Um, you know, at the at the ripe old age of, of five to you know four and five and and so forth. Oops, I'm gonna. There we go. Oh. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about areas of focus um, for the review. I talked a little bit ago about the link between the amount of dystrophin and functional outcomes, and also the treatment benefits from pre-symptomatic. Um, identification. So what, what are the benefits to the children uh, identified in early infancy, especially when some of the medication therapies uh, wouldn't be provided uh, until later? And that brings up the issue of non-pharmacologic um, interventions. So in terms of the um, uh, benefits to the uh, individual and the family. Again, we're still reviewing articles um, from the um, search. The um, advisory committee at one of the earlier meetings asked about um, uh, studies of siblings where you can compare uh, uh, outcomes from an older sibling who might have been diagnosed through usual clinical care to a younger sibling who is picked up because of the diagnosis in the um, uh, older sibling. Um, that's been a, an important um, piece of the evidence for some of the other reviews that we've done. We haven't identified any um, peer-reviewed published um, sibling studies, um, but we did find three meeting abstracts that provide um, some information, but we, we're contacting the authors to get additional information. I'd like to hold off until we have a better sense, um, again, given you know how brief um, abstracts um, uh, are, um, there, there, you know, some reasons that have been put forth to us about why we don't see these, um, uh, 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 sibling, um, studies related to, um, in some cases, families, um, decide not to have another sibling, um, uh, once, once a child is diagnosed in a family. And then there are also complications around genotype, phenotype correlation, even between siblings. In any case, um, we're still looking for this. And, and again, through the other um, articles that we're going through, really trying to best identify the benefits to the individual and the family. So in terms of um, uh, next steps, we're 
we're focusing on the impact of pre-symptomatic identification um, compared with um, usual clinical identification, looking specifically at, at individual and family benefit um, uh, inequities in, in diagnosis and treatment, and then understanding the relationship between biomarkers and patient-centered outcomes. We're also um, trying to better understand how screening might be implemented um, within uh, newborn screening programs. So um, as I talked about in my last presentation, um, CKMM uh, is the is the, the, the standard first tier screen, but um, there, there are different ways of using it, right? So you could do uh, uh, one CKMM, and if that's um, elevated, move on to um, molecular analysis, or you could repeat that. Um, and so th there's, there's different ways of doing that. And then um, uh, once um, it's decided that the child would benefit from gene sequencing, there are questions about who's going to do that. Is that done through the newborn screening lab? Is part of the work that the newborn screening lab does, or is that part of a diagnostic referral? Again, that that makes differences in terms of thinking about um, how this would be operationalized um, if it were to be recommended. Um, again, we're focusing on understanding perspectives from the newborn screening programs um, as part of the PHSI um, survey that we do, and then um, modeling, modeling um, expected outcomes for screening the 3.65 million babies that, that um, are born each year. So again, this is a, a very high level summary of where we are. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions or, or take additional direction from the advisory committee. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Let me open the meeting to questions or comments first with the uh, committee members. Jeff. Jeff Brosco, so thanks, Alex. Could you say a word or two about the, the role of the TEP and how they help in this? Because I, as I understand it, they are folks that you think have the most expertise in this. And part of it is that they can help um, guide you to literature that may not show up in the 7,000 or is easy to miss? Um, I, I think you summarized that exactly right. So, you know, there's 7,000 articles. We want to make sure that we're understanding this correctly. The other thing is that the field has evolved, right, over many years. And so helping us understand the, the lay of the land is um, critical. Again, we don't want to miss anything that's really important. And so we do the best we can in terms of sharing um, our work product with um, the technical expert panel um, beforehand, we're happy to talk to um, advocates to best understand. I mean, at the end of the day, um, our work is well defined by the uh, manual procedures that's been approved by the advisory committee in terms of the, the level of evidence and, and how we go about doing our work, but we wouldn't be able to do it without that kind of um, uh, close partnership. Alex, I, at this time, and maybe, maybe you want to wait until you understand it more, but you talk a little bit about the elements of the improvement assessment scale you're using and, you know, what. Okay, at the, for, the, for the children or for, sorry, for the children? The, well, so the, the standard one that's used is the North Star uh, ambulatory assessment. I'm looking at Dr. Reem out there who knows much more about it than, than I actually do, but that's that's the, the standard one that's used within um, the, the world of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But there are other measures, too, of, of outcomes just in terms of talking about um, time to loss of uh, ambulation, um, need for additional pulmonary uh, breathing support and, and stuff like that. But if you look across um, the, the studies that have gone to the FDA, um, it's the North Star Ambulatory Assessment that's generally used. And if you want particular details, then I'll, I'll plead the fifth and wait till the next meeting to share all the elements that are on it. Fair enough. It's just the question is, are there one elements that might flatten the curve of improvement more than another? So that's when you, when you average them together. So I'll wait for that. We'll, we'll have the answer for you. Scott. Uh, Scott Schoen, uh, org rep from ASTO. I, I guess, Alex, can you help me understand the the not reported clinical outcomes for these? And and like, how does the, what does that mean in terms of how it got through approval? And and I guess juxtapose that with where do you think you're going to find 
the data to help drive the, if there's not a lot, so if, I, I thought I heard you say, so correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. There's not a lot published and there wasn't a lot in FDA. So where does that data come from that yeah. first phase three? So there, there's, there's a lot that's published on TMD and on the use of the drugs and those, those kinds of things. The, what was reported to the FDA is by and large, the, the, um, you know, the, these biochemical markers of, of change. And, and it's the, the patient-centered outcomes that I think usually carry the most weight, which we want to be able to provide. The other thing is that we're really focused not on whether or not the drugs work, but is there an incremental benefit from, um, is there an incremental benefit for the children that are detected pre-symptomatically through screening or however else they might be identified versus usual clinical care? And I, you know, I should have mentioned this, but I, I didn't mention it in my talk, is that let's say something like gene therapy, right? You're not eligible for it until four years, although the FDA may lower that. But let's just say you're not eligible for it for four years. Does pre-symptomatic identification mean that by the time you're four years old and eligible for therapy that you're doing, that, that you're clinically better, you know, and then more likely to have a better outcome? Um, so it becomes very uh, nuanced. It's not just a matter of looking at... Um, the, the direct benefit in terms of you know, patient-centered outcomes, but also comparing the differences in patient-centered outcomes between early identification and later identification. And those are the kinds of things that we're really focused on. Um, at the end of the day, most of the information that I may provide when I come back may be around biomarkers and those kinds of things. But, but uh, again, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're gonna find more um, articles around or evidence around um, uh, patient-centered outcomes. Does that answer your question? I know I kind of went off on a tangent. Well, no, I think what I think it does is that that it's you clarified that it, the challenge seems to me to be linking the biomarker outcomes to the patient outcomes. And that's where the potential gap or yet to be identified. Is. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Online, we have Melissa. Hi, this is uh, Melissa Parisi from NIH, and I just had a question for you, Alex, kind of reflecting some of the comments um, made during the uh, open comment se section. Are there any data that you're aware of that actually show the um, prevention of damage or harm that can occur by earlier diagnosis? And I'm referring to some of the comments related to, um, you know, having ensuring that um, kids with the, the diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy get appropriate physical therapy, access to steroids, and other uh, interventions that will help preserve muscle strength um, and muscle uh, uh, function as long as possible. Um, yeah. That's really one of the key questions that we're looking into. I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid to give you an answer before we're all done in terms of potentially biasing the advisory committee in terms of you know giving a, a yes or no answer to those kinds of things. What I can tell you is that, that we're finding some evidence that, that would support that, but we wanna follow it with authors to, to, you know, like the sibling studies that I mentioned before um, to be able to um, get to that. So. What I can tell you is that there is some evidence um, out there about it in terms of the, the magnitude of difference. I'd rather just not say until we've gone through it um, in, a, in greater detail, but that's, you know, that's the, that's the key stone. I know that's like unsatisfying, but I just don't <laughs> want to give a wrong answer. No, I appreciate it. You're still in the midst of the review, so appreciate your, your response. Robert? Uh, Robert Ostrander, American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, I want to jump back to your comment about one of our one of the things we need to do is to sort out uh, whether it makes sense to do newborn screening if we're not going to start treatment until four. And this takes us back to a discussion I think we've had in the past about distinguishing between pre-symptomatic treatment and um, treatments that are driven by the usual approach to care because 
uh, diagnosing someone through newborn screening, which reduces health disparities in addition, um, allows one to start a treatment that is indicated at age four when perhaps the time to diagnosis with usual clinical care might be six. So I, I, you know, I'd, I'd be interested as you come back next time, you know, distinguishing between those two concepts, usual clinical care and pre-symptomatic care. Yeah, can I, I just, uh, you probably have like another little rejoinder of it before, I, was that the end of the question? Cause I just wanted to jump in real fast. So, so there's really a couple different issues you're talking about. One is if you identify somebody pre-symptomatically big by the time they become eligible for a particular intervention, are they doing better, right? Less muscle damage and those kinds of things. But I think we need to be very careful, especially in the context of Duchenne muscular dystrophy to not, you know, think intervention equals medicine, because there are lots of other interventions that can happen even before, say, four years and you get your gene therapy. It, and yeah, I didn't want to beat that horse because right. I'm always the guy that hands up, stands up and says that. I, I know, I felt like honored to be able to say that right. for you. So I, so I, I almost, in, in my question, said, even with narrow disease-focused medical therapies, there may be advantage to um, diagnosis years before the onset of treatment, but still um, where treatment would be delayed because if you did usual clinical care, the diagnosis might not be made for a couple more years. But thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I say that's, I didn't beat that horse again to avoid um, consternation on all my friends from all my friends here. <laughs> Jennifer? Um, I thought the questions that were raised um, were were very important and it sounds like what, and it sounds like you've heard them as well and that hopefully at the next presentation, you'll be able to connect some of these dots. But I just wanted to make sure I understood Scott's question. Were you referring to the um, slide of exon skipping treatments and the lack of clinical outcomes and, and how that tied in with the biologic markers? And I think that in the, the Duchenne community, but just in the pediatric treatment community, as you probably know, there was some controversy about FDA approval for those treatments. And so I, again, I think that's one of the things that we hope to hear more about. But in um, response to Melissa's question about, I think it was really about early treatment, how many of these drugs are being used earlier than four years, than three years? How many of them are being used in infants? Um, some of them are, and yet I don't know of a lot of publications. So I think That's that true. would be a very interesting thing to for the TEP to bring forward to help you review if it ends up being gray literature um, and for us to hear about. Thanks, Jennifer. I think that ends our session uh, on uh, phase two. And thank you, Alex. So as I said before, you know, during the last year, we've done a significant amount of work and looking at our processes uh, across the committee's work. Um, back in May, Dr. Kemper provided a background on the current decision matrix pool. We had a good conversation at that time about updating um, the process and actually having it more closely uh, match what we've been doing for the last uh, several years and the last few conditions that we voted on recommendations for. Um, during the November meeting, we were in consensus with the proposed updates, which we can provide. They're on the website at this time. Uh, but we also recommended to convene a group of experts to discuss the public health impact assessment portion of the decision matrix tool. And today, I'm going to be sharing a proposal for the impact uh, assessment that we've discussed with this group. So just as a reminder, the, the basic concept is the letter grade, which refers to the uh, magnitude of net benefit and the certainty of net benefit, is a separate consideration than public health 
impact assessment. They're part of the same matrix, that is the information from the assessment needs to inform and be considered by the committee in making its recommendation. But we felt that building it in so that you were a B2 or a B1 um, wasn't quite in the spirit of how other evidence to decision frameworks work, which are almost always based on the evidence of benefit and harm, and then the certainty around that evidence. Yet, the assessment of public health impact is both a statutory uh, requirement for the committee and an important committee uh, process for going forward and making decisions. So what I'd like to do is present um, some slides that I believe captured what we talked about in this public health impact assessment group. Now, the, these are draft. They're not um, set in stone. They're more for discussion. Those who attended the meeting, tell me whether or not I captured it right and put it in drafting these uh, with Jeff's and Leticia's help. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. So next slide, please. The way we thought about doing this is uh, in two phases. And the first phase would be, well, let's learn from those who've already done it because there's a rich knowledge base in actually running a pilot program. And in terms of what we need to ask or assess in the other states should be based on what we've learned from those pilot states. So this is the phase one approach. Next slide, please. So there's a set of questions around, what did it take for you to do this? Uh, and so the questions start with core testing, which for the sake of the discussion, I said this would include confirmatory testing as part of the process. And so we kind of thought, well, what did it take? Did you need new equipment? So for some of the conditions, uh, just turning on a segment of the mark of the signal from tandem mass bet or adding a new um, a new uh, algorithm is something you could build on to the equipment you now have. If you already have sequencing um, equipment, then even adding a genomic confirmatory test may only take turning something on. But for other states, there could be a cost of obtaining new equipment. And if that was required for the pilot test, what was the estimated cost, time to install and set up? And did you actually need to build out new space? So these, I know these sound um, perhaps mundane, but they're critical parts of a newborn screening laboratory thinking about how can I implement this and what's it gonna take? Um, I look at these and my experience with the Colorado State Newborn Screening Program is we had to do all of these when we added a new condition. So thinking about what did it take in that? And then did you need more staff? So how many more staff did you need? Was like an incremental staff, a part of FTE or laboratory scientists or more? And given that, how long did it take for you to hire that person? Is through whatever system your state laboratory needs to go through in order to add personnel, what was the time? And then finally, was there different expertise you needed? So those of us who hire people, I know there are a lot of in the room, these are all things that you have to think about when you're adding new FT, especially for a new process. So another concept, okay, we're adding a new test. What from the personnel standpoint did I have to add? And then finally, there's some really important logistic issues that we've heard about in talking to newborn screening uh, laboratories and programs in the state. Like, did this require new authorizing legislations? We've heard there are a number of states that require um, adding the topic as soon as it's approved on the RUSP. But did you new, need new authorizing legislation? Did you need new appropriations, funds and or FTE? In Colorado, those are two separate decisions. I don't know why, but they're two separate decisions. And then if you did have to add these things, what was the time to require authorization and or appropriation? So we're trying to get a concept of cost and time. Next slide, please. 
So then we move on to questions around follow-up. Again, on diagnostic confirmation, what was the estimated cost and what was the estimated time to develop? In terms of first year treatment, what was the estimated cost? And again, now working with the healthcare delivery system and the experts who are providing the care, you know, what did it cost to get this set up for the first year and how long did it take you to develop it? Did you need new funding required for follow-up? And if yes, how much more and how long did it take for you to develop that funding? Next slide. So the idea is now we have a picture of the impact on states that were successful in doing it. So in, in, in essence, they've actually said it's feasible right? because they've done it. And this is what it took to get there. So the second phase will be to reach out to states who are not pilot states, reach out to states who um, might be quick to implement, might take a longer period of time, might take a long time to implement. So we have a good picture of the different stages of readiness for implement, implementation. So next slide. Here the questions are different. Based on the pilot information, which we would summarize for the survey, if the condition is added to the RUS, could you implement testing within two years? And that's a nice dichotomous answer. Uh, you notice I didn't put, we didn't, we didn't draft, well, maybe, or it depends. We just said, could you? What resources or additional support would you need to do this? External support for startup from our friends uh, at HRSA or potentially CDC. Um, what about regionalization agreements or other things to make it possible or other resources? And then again, specifically, if we added this condition to the RUSP, are you planning to start working on implementation within the next two years? Yes or no? Next slide, please. So how this would come into the decision matrix would be answers to these questions. What's the estimated time and cost to implement testing from, that we obtained from the pilot states? What proportion of respondent states can implement in two years? What proportion would start implementation in two years? And what proportion of states would require additional external support to implement? I think that's my last slide. Oh, no. When, yes, I'm sorry. Very important issue. When the survey process would begin after a nominated condition is accepted for review, by the nomination and prioritization work group. So we wanna time it in such a way that the assessment wouldn't slow down implementation, or let me say it differently, wouldn't slow down the process to um, vote on recommending the condition to the RUSP. And then again, the phase two survey should include states that are likely to move quickly towards implementation and those for whom implementation will be challenging. So that I think is the last slide. Yeah, so I'd like to, again, recognizing this is draft, that it's the first time I think even the members of the ad hoc working group have seen it in this format. I'd like to open up the floor for discussion and if it's okay, I'll sit back down for that. Does anybody other than Scott have the first question? Just kidding. Scott. I was just looking at the committee to make sure I didn't overstep the organizational rep. So Scott Schoen, org rep, ASTO. So first, I want to make a comment that the follow-up slide also needs um, questions about staffing. So you have staffing on lab, but um, particularly depending upon how the test performs, what additional second, third tier tests are needed to be tracked results. Our follow-up colleagues need um, to assure that they're staffing as well. So I would strongly suggest that that be considered uh, in addition to just cost. There's actually um, a human power issue on this follow-up side. Um, but my question is, where did two years come from? Um, is that based solely on the, uh, the tidal wave of rust alignment legislation that's going along? Because the two years 
I think that this committee has had several presentations. New Steps has tracked implementation timelines for the last several years. And I think there's actually, right. And I think there's a, a good level of, um, of quantitative data to show um, in many instances, how long things are taking and why, and whether it's all the steps you talked about, legislation, fee increase, hiring, contracting, all those things that we've talked about at this committee beyond just actually validating a test in a lab and establishing a follow-up protocol. Um, and I think the data has routinely showed that it's longer than two. So I just wanted to know why why two was chosen for, for, for this. It was chosen to have this discussion. <laughs> so, there was another vote for three years and um, it, it was moved to two. I, I don't know what the right number should be, but I want to, I, I think what we do want to do is assure the advocacy and family communities that we think moving forward quickly is important. And I'm not saying that I, I object to two years. I will say in North Carolina, we have three years and there are tests that we implement and can implement in a year or so. And there's tests that do take longer for a variety of reasons. So I wasn't passing judgment on two years. I was just like, I was just trying to understand why um, that was part of it. And I didn't hear it. I just told you we, we had to pick a time okay. and that was the one we chose. Thanks. Uh, other comments, Scott, before I move in on? Can I ask a, a yeah, yeah. follow-up of Scott? So in asking the, the new orange community people here, there's always this feasibility time thing trade-off. Reason why we think it's whether it's two years or three years was the right one is so important is that if I said to you, how long will it take to devise a novel vaccine based on mRNA technology for a virus we've never seen before and deliver it to hundreds of millions of people, you'd say forever, unless it took, the entire nation's resources to do it. And it was done in nine months or whatever. So part of it is how much resources would it take to do in two years versus a year versus three years? And so my question for you is, is it really a trade-off between resources? I mean, if you had enough resources, you could do it in two years, or is it no matter how much you had, it would still take two? Legislation. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Was that, okay, so I think, um, so the, uh, all okay. right. So obviously, uh, as we've talked about and has been talked about even today, that there are state to state differences in, in how this answers. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to answer from North Carolina's perspective. Um, a fee increase will take no less than nine months, right? So that gets, that's automatic in terms of how long the process would take on that aspect alone, not to mention the multi month process to establish positions that can't start until you have fees, the contracting process, all of that. So I, I think that. Um, what I reacted to was the part, one of the questions was, what would it take to do it? And I didn't know if it meant, what would it take to do it in two years? Or what would it take to just get it implemented and on what timeline? Because in a sense where a procurement process takes nine months, I have no jurisdiction over that. And most public health labs and follow-up managers have no authority over how long a state procurement process takes. And, and, and I agree. If this was purely left up to laboratories and follow-up programs, to this newborn screening programs that are comprised of laboratories and follow-up um, staff, that the process likely wouldn't take two years because everybody is committed to doing it as fast as possible. And I think that that when you talk to that, that is the case. But I think that the problem is broader. And it's not just a newborn screening issue. It's a public health issue. But if you have billions of dollars like we did for the um, for um, um, the, the, the vaccine to pour into adding new conditions, I think that the public health system would welcome that and expedite adding conditions for newborn screening. Fair enough. Thanks, Scott. Um, Susan? Hi, Susan Tanksley, Association of Public Health Laboratories. So um, I'm not sure where all my questions are, but I'll start with an easy one. So the for phase two, so this is after you have information from the pilot states, it says survey states, and my assumption at that point, point was all the other states, but then kind of in your closing slide, it, it alluded to a smaller number, um, which let's, I have to find the slide, um, include states that are likely to move quickly towards implementation and those for whom implementation will be challenging. And so I'm just, I'm, wondering what your thoughts are as to that number um, that you would look at in phase two or or is that all states? 
Great question. It's a conversation we had at the working group. And the idea was that it's, we wouldn't necessarily have to do all states, but we'd need a representative sample. And we thought we wanted to make sure to include states who'd say, yeah, bring it on. I mean, there, there will be states who uh, contract out all of their newborn screening. So as soon as the signal can be turned on at in Elmer or Mayo or wherever the samples go, they they could start doing it. Um, and then there will be states that have, I would say, more resource limitations than other states for whom adding almost any condition is going to be a challenge. And the idea is to make sure that we have a representative sample of everything from one to the other. The only, we could do all states, and it would be a question back after this discussion to the working group, um, it, it, we just think it could be efficient, more efficient if we did representative sampling, but then we might miss somebody who's different from the other states. So how would you, would there be a survey or would that be based on, on history as far as how long it's taken to implement conditions? Um, in, it's it's like do you base that on data or is that that uh, is there another method for that? No, I think we were thinking about like um, personal knowledge and experience. But on the other hand, it could be all states. It's just we know that all states don't respond to the survey, and the other issue is that we'd want to make sure that um, when the survey went out that it was. It did include states representative across the spectrum of readiness to implement. Okay, one more follow-up question. Um, so on the three questions uh, that would be asked based on the pilot information, so A was the, if it is added to the RUS, could you implement testing within two years, which you've already discussed. And the C one is, if the condition is added to the rest, are you planning to start working on implementation within the next two years? So is that a, like to measure a willingness or another step in the process or what What would that question? Yeah, or is that just like a process is like, okay, it'll take you more than two years. How far can you get? You got it. For so the idea is that, you know, if we, we added this, would you start working on it right away would you work on it after you've worked your way through other conditions that were added before this um so kind of getting an idea of when the two years might start yeah and and trying to think of the best way to answer that again remember these are draft i appreciate that and, and thinking about what's the information that would be most useful to the committee to consider in terms of what's the public health impact of saying we're gonna recommend this today. And one comment and then I'll stop. <laughs> Is that I think when you do ask these questions, you do need, need to allow for additional comments. So- Oh yes. Case, so <laughs> thank you. In, in fact, it's the additional comments where all the really important information is. So I appreciate that. Um, Deborah, I'm going to come back. I just saw a committee member, Sean. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean McCandless, committee member. But, so how do you anticipate incorporating this information into the decision matrix? That's what's not clear to me. It's really just so simple. The answers to the question will be, print, will be on the matrix slide. So they'll be yours to consider or ours to consider as we think about the vote. So they're not going to fit into making gradations among the A's and B's, but what they will do is provide information for the committee to think about uh, as they contemplate their vote to add or not add. It was almost too simple. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Uh, first, I have Michelle and then Carla. Hi, Michelle Kajana, um, committee member. I think one of the other things behind 
um, see on that slide about the implementation also can help separate the states that do not have the risk alignment legislation per se. So it sort of gives, you know, for states that don't have that um, extra legal pressure to implement within 18 months, two years, three years, you can also get some more information on sort of those outside of that. Great comment. Thank you, Carla. So, so this Carla Cuthbert, CDC. So this is a follow up to what Sean was just saying about how this is going to be used. So, so if the state can't bring this up in two years, but maybe they can bring it up in five and generally the consensus is that many of the states maybe can bring this up in between three to seven years. It, it seems to me that this is just to um, sort of temper our expectation as to when this can actually be done. But, you know, if, if it has, you know, a strong benefit and all those other things, it, we're likely not to say no to it. It's just, it's not gonna happen right away. It'll just take a lot, a lot more time, right? Jeff. Jeff, Jeff Roscoe Hersa. So this is again a question for the state lab folks. I think Carla, that's a, a really good point. And so part of it may be I'm a I'm a state health department and this was just put on the rust, but man, this is going to take five years on average. Is that helpful to state labs and, and departments of health to be able to say, yes, we're going to add it to Rust, but look, the, this is going to take a while, recognize that, but it doesn't stop us as a committee from voting for something on the Rust because of what you said, it's highly valuable, but it does temper expectations and, and make it easier at the state level. But maybe that's a hypothesis, not knowledge. I don't know what you guys think. Oh, I think the other thing, Carla, was we actually hope that we could have information on what it would take. So the cost and time to implementation, the FTE, the space, what are the consider, uh, sorry, the relationships with clinical providers to do um, diagnostic and follow-up care. I think thinking about the impact on the entire system is kind of useful um, for the committee and then hopefully useful to our federal partners in thinking about might they have resources to bring to bear, especially for a condition that the committee feels overwhelmingly positive about the impact of implementing this. So I'm not asking for you for money yet, but we will be. Deborah. Thank you. So I just wanted to clarify and comment a little bit about the inclusion of the clinical centers input into this. I think that um, traditionally when we survey clinical centers input, that's the most difficult information to receive um, because A, either they're not invested or B, they don't have the answers or they don't have the time. And I know that as new conditions have come on, we've sent them out to the clinical centers treating that particular type of condition. And even with a lot of, let's say, browbeating to get results back, that's always been very difficult. So I think we need to think a little broader about strengthening those relationships, as well as what it is that you're actually asking the clinical centers to be doing, what their role would be, whether it would just be treatment or confirmatory or, or whatever it is. I think we just need to think pretty um, discreetly about that. I appreciate that. I, I wonder if you have any suggestions. You say strengthen relationships like so what I do in Colorado is I call Sean up and I say, who do I need to talk to over there at Children's? Uh, and he always comes up with a name. Almost all of them will talk to me. But that's Colorado. And I just don't have a sense for are there other strategies that we should be pursuing and thinking about completion of the assessment so that it's reflective of the challenges of putting this uh, together. Um, you know, I think you kind of put your finger on this because it's really the personal relationships that really make the difference in getting those responses back. And that you call people, you know, you've known them, you've worked with them and to try and get those responses back. But even with that, it's like pulling teeth to try and get responses back. And then sometimes you get responses back and you get two back and one says A and the other's diametrically opposed and says B. And then what's your recommendation at that point? It's you just neutralized everything. Especially when they're from the same institution. Exactly. Yeah. Well, those are good comments. I think um, 
thinking about how to do the assessment uh, and the strategies for collecting information is a really good point. And I think there are, there, I don't, I, sorry, um, Jalili, I don't know how the survey's done now or Susan or Scott, but I do know that there's a strategy of scheduling an interview. It's easier to answer the phone than it is to find the time to fill out a form that's not talking to you. So just thinking about other strategies to complete the information is something we'll look at. Let me pause. Oh, I'm sorry. I got quite, oh, now I got questions online. So I'm going to start with Ash. Ash Lal, committee member. And I just wanted to actually go back to what uh, Sean had mentioned a few minutes back. I think the there seemed to be we were a move to separate out the the feasibility uh, public health. Um, site of the um, newborn new conditions from the net benefit, um, and um, the, the the reason for that, I think it might be in your next presentation too, um, is that um, what what how should the committee view um, information which is um, when the decision is primarily based on net benefit on the feasibility of implementation, <clears throat> um, is that if, if that information is provided <clears throat> at the time of a vote for a new condition, uh, would we have to set up some kind of guidelines on how that information should actually be used and how it would, you think, is potentially going to impact the vote? Yeah, so I, I think it is something the committee could consider. And again, getting to the condition where the committee feels strongly that it should be voted to be added to the RUSP, but there are some public health impact challenges that thinking about what the committee can do in working with federal partners or others to say, we understand that and we wanna figure out ways to ease implementation um in the states over time and you know the committee could could do what i think we really want to do which is expand our purview over more just voting on conditions under the rust but thinking about how we can best uh, support the implementation of screening for all the conditions across all the states so i think it's a consideration we can take in that will provide us information i hope it's not information that we feel we don't have any levers to impact. I would hope would be something different than that. I think the, the issue of having the answer come back, we can do it in three years for every condition is we, we, need, we need something more informative, some information collected in a way that we might be able to move the process forward in a different way. And maybe it's helping states realize that, and I know they do this already, regionalization might be the answer. So I've asked my state lab, okay, if we do um, this condition and it's gonna add this additional test, do you do that now or could you do that now? And say, no, we'd probably send it to somebody else, figure out the cost for implementing it and see if that's feasible and then do that over time. So that's one That's one approach. I think we could come up with, I know the laboratory groups are talking about, you know, these are the challenges that are the roadmap to implementing a new condition in your newborn screening system. And, and this information could help inform that as well. And it would just provide more specificity of information than I think we're currently doing now with the assessment process. Does that help? Uh, Melissa? Melissa Parisi and IH. So I just had a couple quick comments, one of which was, um, and maybe you covered this and I missed it, but why not ask each of the states whether they are, uh, if they have uh, RUSP 
alignment legislation? And if so, what is the typical time frame for adding conditions? It seems like rather than uh, trying to uh, discern that information in a in a non discrete way, just ask the question. But even more importantly, I mean, the, the two year cutoff, which to me seemed rather arbitrary, another way to potentially get some of this, this data might be to ask states um, for the last three conditions that your state has added to the RUSP, how long has it taken from the time they were approved to the time that you were able to add them on? I mean, just another data point. I don't know if that would be helpful or not, but uh, just another thought rather than this kind of arbitrary two-year cutoff. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think there are ways to ask the questions. We just came up with one for this discussion, so appreciate that. Cindy Powell? Cindy Powell, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, ORGREP. Uh, I applaud the committee in trying to tackle this um, part of the uh, decision process. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up is regarding confirmatory testing. Um, I think that you know, one thing to keep in mind is that in a pilot study, uh, confirmatory testing may be included as part of the pilot. And if that uh, may involve some, you know, um, sequencing of, of the gene or genes potentially involved. Um, and after this is, um, you know, put into actual practice, it may be not part of the actual newborn screening, not, not be done by a public health laboratory, but may be, you know, part of uh, that uh, follow up. Um, and in which case, you know, coverage by Medicaid or insurers, um, often infants, even if they ultimately qualify for Medicaid, it might not be, um, you know, in place yet. And which, you know, speaking from experience can add a whole other level of complexity to being able to um, appropriately uh, confirm uh, newborn screening results. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, those are excellent points, Cindy. I think uh, I think in this first pass, this first draft, we were trying to do more um, lumping than splitting. And I know there's a lot of things that we've lumped across uh, that will vary depending on the pilot state and how the uh, pilot was implemented um, versus how it would play out in actual state laboratories across the country and sorry, state laboratories and newborn screening systems. So, Kata, I'm going to get there so I can do it seamlessly. Um, that, so, uh, again, this was a, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Sue. Sorry, um, Sue Berry, uh, SIMD. I think the other dichotomy that is, um, I thought would come up but didn't, is that there are a subset of states where you can't implement anything without active legislative action on the part of the state. And those states are going to be in a different subset than the people who have legislation that rust the lines or don't have legislation or work by rules. If you have to do it through legislation, it takes a long time. That's why it skid took so long because the last states were legislatively um, required to move forward. And I, I, I don't know how easily that can be captured, but it's gonna slow that subset of states down more significantly. I really appreciate that. Let me, uh, we're at time, but let me just ask one last, oh, sorry, Michelle, I see you, go ahead. I'll just be quick. Um, I know that we talked a lot about costs and I think maybe you were talking about splitting. It might be really good to have sort of the program costs versus the sort of system cost, right? Yeah. Because the confirmational testing, confirmatory testing, the um, treatment and all of that is sort of downstream. And then I think states can actually use that information within their own system um, to be able to lobby their, whatever's needed to get funding for those two. So it sort of serves two purposes. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, are there big, considerations or questions that you didn't see. Legislation was one of them. Um, Melissa's right. We know which states have alignment uh, legislation. So that's 
I don't think it'd be too much to say what's the time frame for every state that has alignment issues. Although I would be interested to know, even in alignment states, whether or not understanding the cost and requirements would be useful to state laboratories in terms of taking on implementation. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of point out that in those considerations of adding on, there may be even states with alignment, there may be um, variables, which I think may have been addressed in terms of what it would take to, in terms of equipment, or do you need a whole new system set up versus can you just add that on? So, you know, a state may choose to add something that was added on to the Rust later, do that first because it's easier technically and for all of those kinds of considerations than something that requires lots of new um, processes in place. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know that's true, so. Susan. I just wanted to comment that um, New Steps already collects a lot of that data so as far as like the legislative piece and the rules and whether they're under rust alignment that. So I think that that's a resource that could be used where it wouldn't have to be asked, um, but we'd have to have a mechanism to make sure all that information is updated. I appreciate that too. Yep, I knew it's out there. All right, you've worked so hard, you've earned a 10 minute break. Uh, we're gonna take 10 minutes and we'll come back and talk about uh, considerations for the de uh, decision matrix and weighing benefits and arms. Thanks, coming back, we have kind of uh, one uh, additional discussion that's actually split into two pieces. Um, the first part is um, proposed revision to the nomination package, kind of a redesign. This also was based on a separate working group meeting um, and thinking from a lot of good people, including Jeff Roscoe uh, and others. So I'd like to kind of present uh, what we came up with. The, the comments that we heard last year were things I talked about earlier about it's burdensome, it's difficult, it's unclear. Um, there are words used without a glossary or definition. Um, and there are some things that seem that aren't, uh, aren't within the normal um, uh, workflow of an advocacy organization, certainly not a family. So we try to understand and listen around the challenges uh, that nominators experience. We got feedback valuable from our advocates. Uh, and we talked specifically to those who are currently putting new packages together uh, or packages that are currently under consideration, including CCMV, DMD, CREPE, MLD, and Billy, biliary atresia. So again, these are slides of a draft plan for revision. So we're gonna go through this. We'll take a committee discussion afterwards, and then we're going to do um, um, audience participation and actually try to gather information and comments around what we should be thinking about when we talk about evidence and weighing evidence of benefit arms. So those are the two things that we'll end the day with. And let me start with this uh, presentation on uh, pro proposed draft changes to the nomination package. Next slide, please. Again, we're thinking about a, I'm sorry, here's our current challenges. Burdens on nominators, weeks and months of work go into maybe a condition that's not ready for evidence review. I talked about unclear terminology, there's no area on the nomination form to share additional information. And the work group, the, the nomination prioritization work group, oftentimes doesn't have sufficient information to recommend the package to full evidence-based review. Next slide. So here again, we're thinking about a two-step process. And let's try to think about the first step as a screening process, something 
that um, is less complex, more straightforward, and can start the dialogue between HRSA staff and uh, the chair and committee members on what's necessary for nomination. So here are four questions for the preliminary nomination. Is there a screening test available for use at a population level in the newborn period? Let me pause that there's terms in there that need clarification. Like, what do you mean uh, available use at the population level? So again, when we use a term of art or something uh, that might not be as straightforward to everyone as we think it is to us, we'll make sure that we are very specific about what that means. Is there agreed upon way for a clinical specialist con to confirm the diagnosis after a positive screen? And again, I, as we're, we heard about, in a pilot program, confirmatory testing may still be done at the laboratory itself, uh, or it may require a clinician outside of this uh, newborn laboratory to do that confirmation. Regardless, is, is there a way to go from screening the diagnosis? Because they're, they're not the same. We don't call them screening tests because they always tell you the disease. The screening test is there to tell you there could be conditions. That's where false positives and false negatives come into bear. So what do we have to do to confirm it? Is there agreed upon a way to do that? So these first these first issues are talking about clarity around whether there's a test and a confirmation approach. The next, is there a prospective population-based newborn screening project as, it, as identified at least one infant with the condition? And you'll recognize that from the previous nomination package and uh, it, it is carried over into this um, preliminary nomination. And then number four, does early identification newborn screening lead to better health outcomes compared to usual clinical identification? If there's not information about health outcomes from newborn screening, does early detection based on family history, such as resulting from having an older sibling with the condition, lead to better health outcomes compared to usual clinical identification? And I'll just pause around number four. It is. It, it has in its history the Wilson-Young criteria for any screening test. So the reason you screen is to say that I have an intervention that if it's applied in the otherwise asymptomatic period, that that's better in terms of health outcomes than a, if I wait until you have symptoms. We talked about a lot that a lot with DMD just in the last sessions today, uh, but it's a key factor that there needs to be an answer to in thinking about moving condition forward for nomination. Next slide, please. If yes is there for all questions, the nominators would then submit between one and three peer-reviewed publications for each question to the HRSA website. HRSA staff would meet with the nominators to gather information and present information to the chair and selected committee members. After hearing information and reviewing the publications, the chair or committee and committee members would provide feedback to the nominators on the readiness for step two. And again, there's a glossary of terms to help nominators, as I said, like what does population level mean? So this in a way is a pre-screen of are you ready? Are you getting ready? Should you put the time into a full nomination package? And you get that feedback early on, hopefully when, uh, when the amount of effort taken to answer the four questions is not, you know, is still achievable and doable and, and not the same complexity as a full nomination. Next slide. If the answer is, yep, move ahead, this looks promising. We're anxious to learn more. Complete the complete nomination package with these sections that will go over the condition, newborn screening, net benefit of newborn screening, other considerations, references, glossary of terms, and provincial benefits and harms of newborn screening. Next slide. 
So the idea is to answer the questions as clearly and succinctly as possible. We don't expect nominations to be able to provide comprehensive answers to all the questions, particularly those regarding potential harms and public health impact. We had a lot of discussion about whether or not we should ask nominators about potential harms. And we decided that while the way we think about potential harms may be different, than that from the advocacy community, assuring that you think a little bit, that the nominators take the opportunity to think about potential harms, we think would help the overall nomination package um, and, and public health impact as well. The advisory committee will use that information to decide whether there is enough peer reviewed evidence of net benefit to go to a full evidence review. For each key point you make, please identify the one or most relevant peer-reviewed references. Again, there's a glossary of terms for this, step two in section um, six. And then we encourage nominators to keep in touch with hers of staff as they complete the second stage, as you'll likely have questions about how to answer some of the questions. Next slide, please. So when we talk about section one, the condition, what is the specific condition to be screened for, the target condition, and how is it defined after screening? I, I realize that this sounds simple and maybe it is more simple in the newborn screening world, but not in my experience. There are conditions that have titles that there is variation in the condition under the title. So a great example is Cravet disease. I think uh, we also look at um, conditions that might also be picked up by the same test, uh, as we see in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. One of the most key points that a lot of people, even in the non-screen, non-newborn screening world, but but in the preventive services world, gloss over, is do you have a precise targeted definition? of the condition you're wishing to screen for. So that's what this first issue is. How is the condition typically diagnosed now without newborn screening? So if we didn't have a screening test, what's, I want to say, the more natural history of the condition in terms of when it's diagnosed? How common is the condition? That is, what's the birth prevalence in the United States or some comparable population? And is it more common in certain groups in the United States, which could lead us into questions to explore around equity? And then again, to natural history, what's the typical progression of the condition when diagnosed without newborn screening? Here's kind of a, just an aside, I said natural history. So the natural history would be what would happen if you did no treat, treatment. So once we diagnose things, we tend to start trying to treat them, and so this is really referring to the modified natural history of disease following diagnosis. Next slide. In the next section on newborn screening, what approach is recommended? Please be specific regarding the type of sample and screening algorithm leading to diagnostic referral. So things that are screened to with the uh, filter paper blood spot, Although challenges may be coming over time as, uh, as the number of spots may be inadequate for all the conditions we're concerned about, it does, it's only one route for diagnosis. And so there have been some conditions where urine has been suspected. I don't know how many of you know, but the first newborn screening test was for PKU. And it was uh, by taking infant diapers and doing a chemical reaction on them to see whether or not the children were peeing out phenyl ketones. So uh, there may be other media that, that you would look at. Congenital um, cyanotic heart disease has no sample. It has a test. It, pr it provided specific challenges to this committee and to the implementation world because it's a point of service test that um, state labs don't do. They don't go into... Uh, hospitals and put um, pulse ox machines on infant fingers. So thinking about 
how do you collect it? What's the screening algorithm that leads to diagnostic referral? Once there's a positive screen, how is the condition diagnosed? Specifically, what are the steps a clinical specialist would need to take to establish the condition? So this is kind of the first place where there might be harms associated with screening. So if the route to from screening to diagnosis is invasive, like requires a muscle biopsy, or um, that was just the one, the first one that came to mind, then thinking about the impact of false positives that you then have to resolve through additional testing becomes an important potential harm. So what are the steps to establish the condition? Are there other conditions that would be identified through the same screening? as nominated. That includes phenotypes of the target condition that are not being nominated for newborn screening, like late onset or mild variants. Will screening and will screening for the target condition identify carriers? So all questions help, help, helping to have a sense for the community to think about the specificity of the screening test and leading to the target condition diagnosis. And then what are the approach and outcomes from population level screening for the condition? Outcomes of interest include how much there is, that is estimation of the birth prevalence, the frequency of identification of other phenotypes or condition, screening test characteristics, including sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive values. Next slide. <laughs> Then in section three are the net benefits of newborn screening. What's the expected benefit to infants and families for the detection of the condition through newborn screening compared to the usual clinical identification? This seems straightforward, but there's an important addition that really wasn't in the previous nomination package. It's the inclusion of the phrase and families. So we spent a lot of time talking about that today. And the concept is that benefits to families should and could be addressed with the same research rigor as other benefits. The data could be different. It could be qualitative instead of quantitative. It might be a little bit of both. And we have to, we're, we are interested in bringing in those additional benefits to committee deliberations going forward. Are there other benefits or harms? that might result from implementing a state newborn screening program for the targeted condition. That is infants identified with other conditions or opportunity costs to a state public health system. What treatment and management protocols are available for newborns identified with the condition through newborn screening? And is there a plan for longitudinal follow-up of newborns identified through screening? Will there be a patient registry for how many years would infants with the condition be followed? Next slide. Section four is other considerations, just other things that the nominators want the advisory committee to know, then references, a glossary of terms, and then this draft section of potential benefits and harms of newborn screening, draft in a table designed to help nominators consider the full range of benefits and harms that might occur with, with a screening program. Next. This is uh, just a slide on sample LC research questions uh, that talked about um, what are the potential uh, uh, ethical, legal, sorry, S and I, S LC considerations for a new conditions sources from families, clinicians, administrative databases, and then examples of question, do caregivers that treat infants, do caregivers treat an infant differently when pre-symptomatic uh, diagnosis is made? So these are from our friend in the audience, Dr. Goldenberg, thank you very much. Uh, and it's just a way of giving you some guidance or some thoughts about what questions you might add. I think that might be my last slide. Ah, yeah, so uh, this discussion will be for, this particular part of the discussion will be for the committee members and our uh, colleagues in the um, um, organizational representatives 
And with that, I'll throw it open for questions and sit down. Again, recognizing this is draft. <laughs> it's not been set in stone, um, but it is based off of a lot of the comments we heard and our ex our current approach. Uh, so that's where we're starting from. Deborah? Yeah, I was just gonna kind of expand a little bit um, about the benefits and harms to families. Um, in terms of benefits to families, although I absolutely think that should be included and is an important component, when you get to the operational part of it of states, when states actually think about things, they say our enab enabling legislation is for newborn only, and we don't really care what happens to the rest of the family because that's not within our purview. So I just think that needs to be something we're aware of. Yeah, I, I I appreciate that observation. I don't appreciate that, but I understand it. That would be better. Uh, Molly? Can you provide a little bit more context about the um, collection, collection of long-term long -term data, data in terms of who would have that responsibility over time? Are you envisioning that would be the states? At this point, I don't envision anything, whether we could uh, figure out a way to separately fund a patient registry across states or in some other setting, like it's uh, CDC or HRSA, those would be options. It could be that the state has resources to think about, or a pilot state might have resources to think about it. I do think that it's one of the thing, it, it may be that in every nomination package, it says, yeah, this would be good, but we don't know how to do it. And I think we have to start thinking about that if we want to measure the impact of newborn screening on the health of the population from a public health standpoint over time. But it's a great question. With what with with what I wish was a better answer. Um, Sean? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I'm just thinking about the going back to the addition of the question about family impact on the family. And it, it's com I think it's com very complicated. And I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the underlying principle of newborn screening, that it's intended to improve the health outcomes of the infants involved. And I think that as we heard this morning, the types of data that we will have access to around family outcomes are qualitatively quite different than the types of information we typically ask about healthcare outcome from the infant. And I'm, I just think that it's, I, I, first off, I don't know how, I don't know what I actually think about this. I'm still trying to process the concept. I recognize that in comments I've made in the past, I have, I have specifically commented about family impacts as it relates to harms, and at the same time downplayed family impacts as it relates to benefits. And I realize that that's not, there's a logical disconnect there that I have to wrap my own brain around before I can move forward with my own thinking. But I do just need to step back and say that I think that um, I have a real concern of a situation arising where the where there could be little or no personal health care benefit to the infant involved, but where the argument is that the benefit accrues to the family driving addition of something to newborn of a condition of newborn screening that I think we should be really, really careful about unintended consequences of changes that we make in that regard. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sean. And I was, it was one of the 
ways I was trying to push a little bit this morning about uh, Don around the value statement. And admittedly, I came down to uh, an economic value, but uh, I meant something much more broad than that. How do you weigh these different benefits and the different harms in terms of thinking about the individual impact to the infant? So I think it is an area of, of, of complexity. And I think the committee needs to wrestle with that because I think there are both benefits and harms to families in terms of testing the newborns. You know, I'd, I'd use an example that I often use. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force gave lead screening in children an eye, insufficient evidence. The reason it gets an eye is because there's nothing you can do to the child you just tested. For low levels of lead, other than say, don't live there anymore, there's no treatment. You don't chelate, you don't provide therapy, you don't do cultural, you just say your child's been exposed. However, there's huge benefit to the next child who can be removed from the environment prior to poisoning. And so the USPSTF's methodology has no way of accounting for anyone but the patient right in front of you. And I think this is an area, personally, or something, it's some, so my opinion shouldn't drive the day. But I think from a newborn screening standpoint, thinking about additional benefits as well as additional harms and letting those inform our decision-making uh, could be a really important move forward. And it's how we do it that will be difficult. Yeah, and that, that, uh, that to follow up, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think we need to make sure that we um, are thoughtful about how we prioritize the different types of data and the different benefits and harms. And that we, I think we need to continue to, or maybe need to have more discussion about what is the nature of a compulsory newborn population-based newborn screening program and how is that different from other types of screening that we do and how does that impact the way that we think about the, the evidence base for it? I mean, I, it's a good point because there's nothing in the USPSTF that's compulsory. It's, there's always choice. Uh, Jennifer? Thanks, J Jennifer Kwan, committee member. So I attended a listening group um, that had various um, individuals who had uh, participated in the nomination package um, process. And I guess one of the questions, I, and, and I will admit that I've never participated in the, the process, but I could tell of, of the people who did, who are obviously very well informed about the disorder they're nominating, they felt that a lot of the culture of newborn screening and the language they saw in the package was different. And um, I, I, I got the sense that HRSA feels that they really support um, these nominators through the process. And, and, but from the but I was also getting the feeling that maybe the nominators didn't quite feel the same way, like they they felt lost. And one so one of the things that I was wondering is not so much the wording of the form, but um, it it seems like there is a a role for somebody either at HRSA or someone who it, it is I was even thinking maybe of of like. Um, people who've been involved with the committee work, um, but who maybe are no longer active in it to maybe help nominators um, understand the background. So I think it sort of gets to what Sean had brought up. I, I just think that sometimes people um, are they they feel that it's so obvious why this disorder should be why, why they should have known about this disorder when their child was born. Like so much of their life and their child's life would have been so different had they known. So obviously it should be on newborn screening. And then they learn some basic things about newborn screening and they realize this may be a harder, um, this may be a harder hurdle than I thought. 
And, and so I was just wondering a little more about the background of the, the process that, that I just don't know very much about what, what HRSA does when they're speaking with non believers and, and how long it generally takes to get them through the process. Jeff? Oh, I thought I saw you saying, raising your hand. No, I didn't reach you down. Let me say a word. Uh, if it would, if it would be a, to the pleasure of the committee, that'd be great. Uh, just simply that in this, in this process, Jennifer, so, um, folks from CCMV, from DMD, from MLD and from Billy Retrieve. So the last four nominating groups have kind of gone through the form. We, we met with them and said, what are all the biggest issues you've had? What are the problems going forward? Yes, HRSA is, you know, we're supposed to be helping you through this process. It's clearly not going as well. We heard from them. It takes a huge amount of time and energy and just emotional like work to get through this huge thing, um, only to find out that maybe we weren't ready or something. So in, in the two-step process, we really tried to figure out how could we both meet the needs of nominators, but also not slow the process down so much. So this is a, an attempt to do that, is to meet the needs of nominators so we can quickly get to what are the key things. Um, and so the idea of those initial four questions is we gather the information, we present it to the committee, which is usually the chair and a couple of members, and there's some right away back and forth. So there's a very low initial bar for nominators to get a sense of, yeah, we're ready, let's go for it. Or no, we really need to have a treatment, we need a better test, whatever that is. So that was the, the idea of it, because you're right, there's this, um, that's exactly what we heard too, is that nominators were there to help, but it hasn't been sufficient. Ash? Yeah, it's just looking at the, the other sections, so section seven that has the table potential benefits and harms. I, I can definitely see the utility. I think if the nominators can upfront address some of the um, um, questions regarding harm in addition to uh, you know the, the advocacy for including the condition that would certainly move the process along. Uh, but um, my question is, is this table um, something that it will be included from published literature or is this something that is currently being developed and if it could be shared for comments? Yeah, no, everything here is to be shared for comments. I'm sorry, Jeff, did you have another comment? Sorry, Jeff Roscoe again. So just that, that table that comes from a publication that Aaron was, was um, the chief, and it's there as a appendix kind of thing, that if nominators wanted to look at the kinds of issues that might be relevant, they could use that as a tool, but it's not meant to be comprehensive. And just to add one other thing, we also learned in talking to the nominators that we couldn't predict ahead of time all the kinds of questions that they would have. And so that's why this having um, plenty of room for dialogue early on and say, you don't have to put in anything about public health impact or harms, but if you know something about it, you can. If you're planning a patient registry, please tell us. But if you're not, that's okay to say no. So it really was meant to create a dialogue. Thanks, Janine. Uh, I guess my question is really for Jeff and his uh, comment that he just made. Um, is there some sort of instruction booklet or something that groups can know that um, when they see this daunting list of questions that you don't have to have a publication that addresses that, but if you know of one, tell us that, you know, the ones that are optional versus the ones that are not. And I could well imagine that groups get very focused on, you know, the medical, the treatment, the diagnosis part, and um, could get to this point of, of uh, getting thinking they're ready for our nomination package and realizing, oh, there's questions in here we could have been working to address those. We just didn't know we were gonna get asked that. And they could have facilitated the research uh, around that question, especially the family sort of questions and the sibling questions and the registry questions. Um, and so I, I don't know what is available or if there should be more available for really advanced, maybe the, the groups that are five years out uh, to know what it is that they're gonna face and the kinds of questions they'll, 
address before they even uh, talk to a HRSA person. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I do think a user's guide is something that's that be relatively easy for us to put together. Again, the kind of step one questions are meant to say, what should I be thinking about in terms of answering these first core four questions, which will help guide whether or not, you know, this condition is ready to be brought forward or what else is going to be needed. And it's answering those first four that once, you know, I think Herza and the chair say, yeah, it looks like this is ready for uh, more detail that you would move on to step two with the more detailed questions. And again, I think there would be another um, set of uh, guidance on how to fill those out. I like your idea of saying this one has to be answered. I think we already think about that. Uh, and these other ones are discretionary, but could help um, the HERSA think about the condition and would be useful for nomination and prioritization in assessing the evidence and thinking about it's ready to move on for evidence review. Uh, I'm going to come to you, Margie, but can I go through the ones in front of you first? Did, did you, or did you hold up your hand before I? Oh, no, that was the first time I held it up. It's just you can't see my. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I saw your <laughs> All right, I have Natasha next. <laughs> Thanks, Natasha Benham, Genetic Alliance. Um, I did want, you know, tied to the part of the conversation with um, Jennifer and Jeff talking about the support for um, nominators. And just to acknowledge that there is a lot that happens to support those nominators outside of the HRSA framework, even though we know that that is what we're talking about here today. Um, the, those nominators are very well connected with each other. They study the nominations that have come before. Um, I don't think there's any group that just wakes up one day and says, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dedicate nine months to filling out this process, to filling out um, the nomination. So I just really wanted to acknowledge that between also us having invited committee members to the boot camp that is co-hosted between Every Life and Expecting Health, that there's a lot else that goes on and maybe there's some learning there too in terms of those conversations that had what has been supportive and what could be even more supportive for those nominators. So I just wanted to acknowledge all of that um, other work that goes on. Um, and then my question was to, um, and I know these are draft, um, but I, I was thinking to the step one preliminary nomination, and this is just an example of, but where it says the question three, is there a prospective population-based newborn screening project? Is that globally? I think historically we've always looked for the US. You know, those types of details, are you thinking of adding in those details as this moves from draft to final or, or not? Yeah, that, that would like, be Like, are there better. things that, I, I just wanna be clear, where are the things that maybe assumptions like, oh, of course it would be a state-based newborn screening program, or maybe it is an assumption, maybe it is global. Yeah, that's, that's a level of specificity that will be added that hasn't been. So good question, thanks. Robert. Um, Robert Ostrander, American Academy of Family Physicians. I wanna just go back to the way we think about the family benefit piece. Um, some and, and Sean's concerns. Um, for the first 20 odd years I was in practice, um, I did family centered obstetrics and delivered babies, and rarely did I consider the baby's benefits and harms separate from the mother's and the mother's benefit from harm separate from the baby's benefits and harms. And I don't think the moment of delivery completely breaks that link. Um, you know, so I think when we're thinking about newborns and, and uh, medical homes for kids with special health care needs, um, it would be an unusual situation where there was a benefit to the family that I didn't think benefited the child and not that one couldn't think of things. And furthermore, I, I think um, if there were no benefit to the child for disease treatment, whether medically specific um, 
disease treatment or um, you know general uh, disease specific treatments or general treatments that modify the course of the disease, I can't imagine that the assessment of family benefit would be positive because I think the place that everybody's seeing potential family harm is the positive, the false positive screen, the variant of un uh, unknown significance or the diagnosis of a disease for which there's no treatment. So um, I think we have to be vigilant. I agree, Sean. I think we have to be sure that, that there is net benefit to the child. But I think, um, again, I think it, it would be rare in my mind to see a net benefit to the family that didn't somehow um, also then uh, confer benefit to the child. I think we're kind of moving. I think we're kind of moving into what we expected would be the last discussion of the day, which I think is a natural <laughs> movement. I think <clears throat> we did um, get a lot of comments about what benefits and what harms should be considered. Um, and I think what we're hoping for the last discussion is just talking about when we're weighing certainty and net benefit, uh, what are the full range of relevant peer-reviewed evidence we should be looking at? Um, it, it, most, most of the evidence we've looked at is in relationship to benefits and harms to the individual, and those are still paramount, but the committee should consider benefits and harms to the family and to society at large, including including looking at issues around equity. Should the committee consider evidence demonstrating benefits for the family regarding future planning in terms of finances, ge geographic proximity to services, home design? Should there be earlier access to early intervention programs or, or are there opportunity costs to the public health system? And that's um, the... It comes back to the issues overall, how is funding constructed for uh, newborn screening in a state? And it only varies 50 times, even in states with alignment regulation. So um, before we kind of watch down this, let me make sure I go back to Margie and get her comment. Thanks, Margie Ream, Child Neurology Society uh, Org Rep. Um, so I had a question back to the nomination um, form. I think it was in your first of those two presentations where there was a, a line about, um, you know, other conditions that could be picked up or other phenotypes that could be picked up by the proposed screening. So a question and a story. So the question is, um, you know, how does the committee feel like where the line would be drawn between something being a secondary condition, which, you know, would be considered beneficial to pick up versus a false positive, which would be generally considered unwanted. And so the story I have to kind of frame the why I had that question in my mind was, um, you know, taking, for example, XALD, I get a baby girl, screen positive, she's diagnosed, and then we can diagnose her brothers. That would be beneficial. Um, but if a younger sister of a symptomatically diagnosed boy came and family wanted the younger sister tested, I wouldn't offer that testing because that wouldn't be considered ethical. It wouldn't help that individual patient. And so same condition, same diagnosis, but you know, one diagnosis through mandatory testing is positive where a clinically requested diagnosis would be not considered a positive. So, um, you know, as a clinician, that's a tricky situation to be in. You have the same question of baby, you know, baby girls in neighboring rooms, basically. Um, so back to my question for the committee is, you know, what are some of the considerations you would use for when one of these other diagnosed conditions would be a secondary target versus a false positive? That's a great question. It's also partially a subject that's been looking being looked at by laboratory work group on secondary conditions and condition counting and um, a level of complexity that I hope we would be able to capture in the nomination package. Um, in, in the other areas like um, USPSTF or the CPSTF, 
there are these things called uh, other benefits. Um, and so if I'm doing this one thing and I find something else that uh, might also benefit from that, or I'm doing a treatment that treats one thing, but there are additional benefits, how do you capture those and how does that drive decision making? So I think making sure the nomination package has the ability to have that flexibility over uh, other conditions that could be treated and helpful, I think they can be answered, but it would be kind of in that other benefits considerations that helps. And that's what we're, we're talking about a lot of other benefits. I think one of the things that um, I think comes up in genetic testing, which that reminds me of is um, um, evidence by analogy. And so are there other gene uh, polymorphisms that look so much like the polymorphism for which you have evidence? Do you think it's reasonable to make uh, uh, a decision by analogy? And so in this space, you know, would there be conditions that aren't the condition under review, but that uh, we could consider other disorders because it's relevant to that condition. So those are the kind of areas we wanted to kind of first ask the committee and then our, um, our organizational reps and then throw it open to um, the rest of the audience. What, what are the kind of things that we should include around family history? I keep talking about opportunity costs, which in a severe tax limitation state like Colorado, it, it's a real, it's a real issue. We could not, we would not be able to add a condition in the next two years that cost any money because there's no money for the next two years. So that that's it's like, okay, I got that. So that's an opportunity cost. What are you going to not do? How are you going to address the overall system that has to respond to many, many important public health needs, one of which is newborn screening. So that's the kind of opportunity cost issue, which maybe doesn't occur to everybody, but I think about quite often. So we do are thinking about considering the full range of peer reviewed evidence. And the concept is we wouldn't use a lesser bar to evaluate qualitative research or search on these other family related outcomes. We, sh we don't need to. And so the idea is that we want evidence based um, uh, evidence. Uh, we will use, we'll prioritize the individual's child, but we could also look at benefits and harms to the family to society and make sure we consider equity. Uh, and I talked about these three issues. And then um, uh, harms and benefits should be supported by peer review evidence directly relevant to the consideration under review. However, can we learn things from other conditions that might help the committee in making its decision? So now I'll pause and maybe we've all talked these out on the committee so far, but. Are there additional thoughts from the committee? Or the organizational reps? Sean. Um, so I guess uh, Sean McCandless committee member. The, so we're, if, if the, Committee is to, I'm looking at the last bullet point, harms and benefits should be supported by peer reviewed evidence directly relevant to the condition under review. Part of the problem that we constantly have is that there is little to no significant research. I mean, people about harms, people can point to a, a couple of ongoing studies, specific individual studies that for a couple of conditions are trying to assess harms. I just want to be thoughtful that we're not creating a bar here for evi the evidence-based requirement for hypothetical harms that can't be met with the current system. So, it, because one way to interpret that would be to say, unless there's a peer-reviewed document, peer-reviewed paper that demonstrates harm, we shouldn't consider that, and that. That would be ideal. 
Um, but I think both for benefits and harms, it's important to keep in mind that there are going to be some potential and maybe potential and obvious or maybe potential and less obvious harms and benefits that we still need to be able to think about, in my opinion. And may, maybe the underline is too dramatic. <laughs> I think uh, I would point out the use of the word should. So, and, and maybe it's really ideal it should. Um, and we need to be open to thinking about where, where the evidence is less strong, but the potential for harm is still great. So, okay. So is there anyone um, in the audience who would be interested in coming up to the microphone and giving us a thought about potential benefits and harms? And if you could just identify yourself for the record, that would be great. Thank you. I'm Matthew Ellenwood. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the National MPS Society. We have the distinction of actually having written two successful nominations to the RUSP. I have written one. Uh, I would observe that the current form is not yet two years, or just two years old. It's two years and one month old. And uh, I don't know that the considerations for changes really give you much uh, greater flexibility for advocacy organizations to fulfill. HRSA worked very well with us. It was about a nine month period for us to work out the kinks to get our MPS2 nomination in. Regarding harms and benefits, I'd like to echo what Sean said. Let's just think, try a thought experiment, a year to get agencies to approve funding for research, a year to get the applications in and get them approved, two to three years to do the research. We're talking five years before there is a body of literature to help support information on this. We're, we're already creating more bars than we need to for advocacy or organizations to get things through. There are family benefits, there are family harms. I think for the most part, the family harms are associated with the false positive diagnosis. I would concentrate more on that. This is never gonna be a body of uh, uh, information you're gonna have conclusive research on. It's just too difficult to do. With rare diseases, we cannot get the level of epidemiologically accurate information in our kind of atomized healthcare delivery system. It's just gonna to be too problematic. I'd also like to have a, put a pitch in to the committee, reconsider the end of one rule. There is no need for one prospective program to screen and identify and confirm and treat a patient when all of those elements can pr be provided uh, in parallel rather than series. If we have not learned anything from COVID, we move faster when elements of any scientific medical problem are chopped up so we can pursue them in parallel rather than in series. We are indeed right testing a system, Scott, but testing a system in North Carolina is not going to be the same system that gets instituted in Ankeny and Iowa City and Denver and Phoenix. So, okay, enough then. Thank you. Thank you. Next, and please identify yourself. Lisa Brackbill, Leukodystrophy Newborn Screening Action Network, but also a Crab A disease mother. When discussing the harms and the benefits, I just want to remind you all from the family perspective that no matter when the child is diagnosed, whether it is through newborn screening or symptomatically, the family has to deal with that reality. And I believe the harm is far less when it comes through newborn screening because the family has options. Otherwise, like in our case, our only option is to watch our child die a painful and long suffering death. So no matter what we are harmed, but we have to look at what, like what, what harm is less. Um, you know, the family, I love that you did mention that there are psychological benefits and harms. We are more likely to have things like PTSD. <laughs> things like that from our child's diagnosis when it's symptomatic. And so I understand that we have to take all this into consideration, but I just wanna make sure that those of us who didn't 
have the benefit of newborn screening, that our voices are heard as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, as we always say, it is just a screening. So the parents get to choose what to do with that information. They're not forced to treat their child, but they're given those options, which I believe is a benefit greater than any of these harms. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please identify yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Amy Gaviglio. I'm a genetic counselor and consultant for a number of organizations in the newborn screening space. For me, I think as we think about benefits and harms, and I'm really glad that the discussion is around what does evidence look like for both of these, but I think what feels like is it's missing, and maybe this gets to some of your question, Dr. McCandless, is but how is it actually going to be used in the decision matrix? What is the threshold? How, how much do we need to show more benefit than harm? Um, and how do we set up a system so that that remains constant and, and that decision isn't dictated by who's on the committee and who feels harms are, are more you know, evident than, than benefits. So I think really thinking about this discussion, not just in what should we be collecting as it pertains to evidence for benefits and harms, but being very clear then and how that is actually going to be plugged in consistently into the decision matrix will be really helpful for advocates who are trying to submit a nomination and I think often feel like the goal post moves. Um, as we talk about benefits and harm. So I would just encourage a lot of that discussion on um, kind of not just what we're collecting, but then how you're going to actually think about benefits and harms as it pertains to the matrix and, and what is that threshold for a yes, no vote. Thank you. Yes, please identify yourself. Uh, Don Bailey, RTI International. Um, so first I need to say, I think most people know that I'm on this on the National Academy of Sciences Committee. I need to be very careful about saying things that are giving advice because I want to make sure it's not an advice coming from the National Academy of Sciences Committee. It's a personal, personal opinion. So here today, just saying, um, as you might expect, I really appreciate the thinking about, you know, expanded considerations of, of harms and benefits. And I think that's especially important when there's, um, it's a close call. You know, there's a group, that, you know, it's like, like with the Crab Bay vote, it's seven to seven. There are people came in with different values and different perspectives and weighing harms and benefits in different kinds of ways. And thinking about those maybe a little more broadly could have helped either push the decision either way. Um, but uh, so, so doing it in a comprehensive way is especially important. I would say that there might be a, a set of harms this is going to the last one and to your comment a bit, a bit, um, Sean. So a set of harms that will never be able to answer the question, and maybe benefits too, but I'll just focus on harms for a minute. It will never be able to answer on a condition by condition basis. But there may be some general harms that we have been brought up over and over again, like harms about uncertainty about later onset, harms about false positives, um, harms about carrier detection. There could be a a collection of information that's gathered about those topics that then could be used as, as the committee is having these discussions. It doesn't necessarily have, you could then bring it to discussion for this particular disorder. Um, but having that knowledge base that says in general, here's what we know about anxiety, about uncertainty, and here's what could be done to mitigate it, then that could help um, maybe inform or answer some of the questions about the harms that are otherwise brought up for that particular disorder when it, it may have been answered in a number of other contexts and just not this particular one. Thank you. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dylan Simon with the Everlife Foundation for Air Diseases. Uh, I do want to take a moment before going to my comments just to thank the committee for this opportunity to provide comment. The patient community has long asked for the ability to engage more directly with this committee. And from the listening sessions of last year, this comment section, this is much appreciated as you can hear from the tone of the previous comments. Uh, for me personally, I want to bring up a couple points uh, to Dr. McCandless's point in terms of setting high bars. I think what we need to think about is in addition to the benefit of harms, when reviewing the package, the potential harms of setting too high a bars that a com community cannot submit a package in and of itself. So when we're talking about the, the harms and benefits should be specific to an individual condition, I know you said that is a preferred method and understand that that may not be possible. 
But when communities are going to be looking at that on the website and may not speak directly to HRSA first, their first interaction is going to be the website. They're going to see that and say, well, there's no world in which I can develop family benefits and harms to my community. And so you're going to see communities not even attempt to submit a package. And we're well aware that there are significant harms to that to many within the rare community to think that it's not even possible. A new one treating to them is not even possible at the federal level. So I want to make sure to recognize that there needs to be a high evidence based standard, and we're not here recommending to lower that. But every time you add a new bar, you're making it harder and harder for members of the community to submit a package. And to the point that Natasha Madone made earlier, there's already so much that the community is doing, whether it be pilot studies or helping to support the development of diagnostics or the therapeutics. We add more requirements on top of that that will require more resources, more funding, more manpower, you're going to lose communities along the way that don't have that. So I just urge the community to keep that in mind as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? Thank you. Sean McCandless, committee member. I think um, that, that this is an opportunity, I think, to sort of thank the people that did the hard work on this, because it does seem to me that the proposal that's that's been made to have sort of a preliminary, simpler approach to kind of ticking the first set of boxes, to me, that seems to, that does seem to level the playing field. And it, it does reduce the burden for groups that may not have uh, that, that for very rare diseases where it's a smaller number of people involved or where there's not pharmaceutical companies that are supporting the effort to develop newborn screening um, packages. It, it seems to me that that levels the playing field uh, and does help a, a smaller community or a less well-resourced community kind of at least get over the initial activation and energy of, is this even feasible? And so I think that I think you all should be congratulated for the work that was done because I think it is I think this proposal is an improvement over the existing system, um, and the the um, then it it also sounds like there will be more that the process will be more clear cut. And therefore, the support from HRSA and from other groups should be able to be more clear cut and helpful to again reduce the activation energy for those uh, less well resourced conditions and support groups that are, are advocating for newborn screening. So, to me, it seems like a really good opportunity to say to the people who did the work here I think this is actually a step in the right direction. Thanks, Sean. I think. Um... We we did talk a long time about that last table. Should we ask? Should we ask nominators? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I get to talk sometimes. <laughs> She's making sure I saw your cards. Never mind, Natasha. You go next. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to finish your thought? I'll, I'll remember it. Okay. <laughs> um, Natasha Benham, Genetic Alliance. Uh, a question that I had um, as the committee or ad hoc group was discussing harms and benefits, how much discussion went into um, deciphering between harms and benefits of the information versus the process versus the communication. Because we have so much that um, hearing from families who have gone through, let's say a false positive, who it really so much was how the information was delivered. So it's not so much you had a false positive, but it was the how that really caused the harm or allowed, made it become such a particularly negative extended negative moment as opposed to a, that was hard, but I worked with my pediatrician and we were able to figure it out. I'm trying to think where does that fit in since for the limited research that we have done in this space that comes up all the time. And that is not about a particular condition or a particular screening modality. So I don't know if that came up in the discussion as you are uh, putting this together. I don't think we thought about it that specifically. 
I did this morning though, when I heard presentations on service versus outcomes. And so that was really important for me to hear. So I think we're broadening that concept of what could be there. Um, Susan? Susan Tanksley, Association of Public Health Labs. Um, maybe a simple question. I'm just wondering how um, this process in, in reevaluating the nomination process lines up with the work that NASM is doing and like even what the timelines are for those. Sorry about the heavy sigh. I think the NASM study could inform this. I also know that NASM studies take a while having been on several of them. So I, I feel like the next version of the nomination package m m has a chance of maybe going into the field prior to that report coming out, but maybe I'll be wrong. <laughs> so I appreciate the concept because you're right. They're talking about the things we're talking about. Dean. All right. Would you please introduce yourself? Of course, Dean, sir, MLD Foundation. Uh, I just like to echo what uh, Dylan started us off with, which thank you for including us in the conversation and having a dialogue. This is this is very reinforcing uh, because this package ultimately is for us, the the community, the advocacy groups, and so on. And so to have a voice and input is appreciated. Um, uh, Dr. McCandless, I think I just wanted to reflect on your comment about leveling the playing field. Um, respectfully, I think uh, uh, Natasha mentioned this, but also what uh, Every Life and, and Expecting Health are doing, the boot camps and those kind of environments, it, it amazes me. I was a speaker at one of the early ones and attended a number of the others. It amazes me the number of groups that are coming there to figure out how to do newborn screening. And the message as they walk away, or certainly as we engage with them, is not, you can't do this but let's talk about how you can and what are the problems and what are the challenges. So there's a lot of help out there for them. But I want to tell you, I've talked about harms and benefits before. I think we, I want to apply that to a different group. I want to apply that to the committee. I want to make sure, because we've talked over the past few years of the tsunami of potential nominations uh, coming your way. I want to make sure that what appears to be a stepping stone process, and mind you, I haven't seen the forms, I haven't quite grasped all of this, but how this process, which you've reflected, should make it easier for us or step by step. By the way, I'd never take a first step without knowing what the next three or four are, because either I don't want to waste my time or I'd want to get my ducks in a line so that I didn't get a, a partial yes or a partial no early on. But what does this mean to the committee and your engagement along the way? Is it more work? Does it take more time to talk about MLD or any other disorder two or three times instead of one or two times. Um, I think we ought to be thinking about that in that context too, because throughput of your committee, throughput of the evidence review, and now the nomination and prioritization, which I'm, again, I'm not quite sure how that fits in here with this, this intermediate step, but I, I just want to give the grace, I would say, that it's not all about us, it's about you as well. And we as, a, as an ecosystem need to work efficiently together. Thanks, so I, I I, what I was going to say was we talked a lot about whether we should ask um, nominators to fill out the table. And, and I'll try to say it again. It wasn't meant to be a, a bar like and, and maybe that needs to be in the explanation. You may want to think about this. Um, and so the idea is that nominators are thinking about potential arms and benefits, but recognize that that's what the evidence review is for. Not only are they going to find that, but they're going to quantify it, which gets me to my second point. The way to consider family benefits and additional harms is through evidence. And so the evidence bar still needs to be there for saying we believe there are family benefits associated with this. The issue about harms is that we don't routinely look at harms. But I think thinking about how appropriately to think about harms, and I think we can often at least apply numbers to them because we have quantitated estimates of false positives and false negatives and predictive values that can be attached to most tests. But to always think that it's an evidence-based approach um, uh, is just, I think what we're trying to do by saying supported by peer-reviewed evidence. So I, I don't wanna, 
make it think that if we're going to consider family values, they're not going to need to meet an evidence bar. But what I will say is if they're not in the nomination package, they don't have to be in the nomination package. It's very clear that all of the benefit might accrue to the individual child themselves, uh, in which case that's plenty, right, for sorting through, thinking about the evidence uh, and looking at risk benefits. Uh, and we will have to deal with the issue about in the harms associated that we don't measure well and that we do worry about purposefully. Uh, they come up in the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force every review. Um, so it's just something to, to, to keep in mind. So we're, we're the last thing is that I, I actually think this dialogue with HERSA staff early is going to help. So maybe you're already thinking about steps three and four, but would you like some guidance on questions one, two, three, and four that might help you as an advocate or a family move a little farther ahead? The last issue about the tsunami is I expect it, it's going to come after I leave, which is fine. No, yes. I, I think we're thinking about that as well with the prioritization strategies that Dr. Kemper and the evidence-based review has, has thought about. And as that actually hits, I think the committee will adapt its processes, its size, its staffing to accommodate any real in incredible increase in the number of conditions that, that come to us at one time. I, I feel like that <clears throat> we adapt we're adapting now. The issue is about, you've only had this for two years. I've read nomination package that came out of that and it needed to be revised. So I just know that. So we wanna be a learning community. I would say this is a refinement of our processes, not a redesign and, if, and we'll try it. And we will find the issues that don't work as well as we'd hoped they would. And then we'll refine them again. But it always has to be like we're doing now in contact with the people trying to put together nomination packages so that we can look at them in a timely fashion uh, and get our decision making in a more timely way. So hope that helps. Uh, Michael, do you have anything you would add to the discussion? Sorry, I always have to pick on the, the Michael. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, the conversation today and just want to reflect on um, the last part and the this notion of the tsunami of of potential nominations. And I appreciate the the mention from the speaker earlier. I, I do think the, the pragmatist in me does think a lot about what does this look like from a HRSA staffing and resource standpoint. And so I I I think it's helpful to at least state on the record what those limitations are. Um, you know, the, the budget for the heritable disorders, legislative authority, the current budget outlook, all of those factors come into play. And it's um, there's not just a, a situation where the committee wants to change this process, go hire five more FTEs. Um, I wish that were the case. So we will have to navigate that as it comes. And I think we feel very strongly that having more engagement, um, being more transparent, um, and in particular engaging families more uh, is the right thing to do. And so we want to at least have this dialogue and understand um, what the needs and desires are and then do the best that we can figure out how to make that happen. Thanks. Oh, uh, sorry, to not forget, there will be a federal registry posted for people to provide written comments to what we've talked about today. I uh, hope those of you who wanted to think a bit about it first will do that and people who are online, I think might want to do that as well. Uh, I will pause since we were not quite at time. <sighs> you thought you'd get out of here early yeah, to see if there are any online public comments. Oh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not certain of the process. I just know we won't see you. So someone is figuring out that you're there. If you'd like to make a virtual public comment, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom.
And while we're waiting, please identify yourself. Hi. Uh, Dylan Sign from Every Life Foundation. Again, happy to a little time why uh, those online find the raise hand function. Uh, one thing I did want to flag um, just more, I know we're not getting into the logistics today, um, but as you decide this, recognize what the implementation timeline for this will be. Uh, there are multiple communities right now who are preparing packages and they're waiting for the until the May pause. That's understandable. Uh, but it's talked about here and in the previous slides about new requirements needed for the data. And if that's brand new information those communities need to collect, there needs to be a thought process into how are we going to phase in this implementation to ensure the fact that community that has a package ready to go on May 15th now all of a sudden doesn't have to take another year and a half to go collect new data. Uh, and so what does that process look like? And it can look at a variety of ways, but they just want to flag as a logistic as you get into the details to look at. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, and so noted. So I think we have no uh, comments provided on online. So, uh, oh, I have Michael Gelb raised a hand. Michael. You should be able to speak now, Michael. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me? I, I want to. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about um, harms and, and benefits. And uh, I just want to say um, things, that, things have gotten a lot better in the last five years. Uh, I, I don't know what all these harms are that you're talking about. I mean, Sean McCandle has talked about a Crabbe story where, um, you know, the family got ruined because of a false positive. I mean, those days are long gone. With, with second tier markers like cytosine and glycosaminoglycans for MPS1, there essentially is no false positives. Now there is late onset disease, but with these biomarkers, we're pretty sure the late onset disease is coming, you know, in the first one or two decades of life. And so I, I think that I think for MLD there is no false positives and there is no false negatives and it's all published. So so I think we need to go a little bit easy on all the harm discussion when things coming, there isn't any harms, essentially. The tests are, are nearly perfect if we do them right. And I think it's important that newborn screening labs take on the second tier tests or at least that it gets done, but we see a, a mixture of uptake in newborn screening labs refusing to do second tier tests. Like in Ohio, they don't do cytosine. I mean, it's crazy. So we need to get better at that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we've come to the end of the agenda. I wanna pause again. And first of all, thank all of our speakers. The presentations were outstanding, gave us a lot to think about, filled in some gaps for at least some of us. Uh, and I can only tell you how much I look forward to, uh, to your instrument as it rolls out, as you get more experience and you generate data that we can use to assess family impact of screening, treatment, and other things associated with newborn screening. Great, I really appreciated um, uh, uh, Aaron coming and being here with us in person and having to watch your team lose from Rockville. Um, uh, but your presentation didn't suffer a moment. It was absolutely great, as was Dr. Ackerman's, and really, I think, helped move us all forward in our thinking. Alex, I appreciate the update on um, DMD. I know we're all anxious about the final present, the upcoming presentation, um, and that'll be fantastic to hear as well. I appreciate the input of all the people who served on the working groups to provide the draft slides that you saw today and the active discussion that will help guide changes and help us fill in the blanks of all the things we forgot to include because that's why presenting provides. And then finally, for the comment uh, public comment periods, I realize it's difficult uh, for many people, if not most people, to speak in front of a group of people. For some people, it's uh, the worst, the most scary thing you ever do. Um, and everyone was so 
accomplished at it. I appreciate the time, effort, and the shared experiences and knowledge that brought forward. And the last thing I would say is thanks to everyone who made a public comment. I think you showed us that something we could do, we could probably do on a regular basis uh, in that kind of more interactive forum as we did at the end, especially when there's um, specific topics where that kind of more free flow of information and dialogue can be beneficial to the committee in its learning and it's doing its work. So it's not like we're done yet. We have a full day tomorrow. We have very important public comment period and then um, expedited evidence review and discussion of vote on um, crab A disease. Uh, and there is just, just so you don't leave early an APHL um, presentation after the vote. Did I miss anything, Leticia? It's been a great day. Thanks so much for your time and have a good evening.